Good evening, uh, and I'm going to call to order the select board meeting of June 4th at 6.34 p.m. Uh, we'll start with our uh, opening remarks, announcements, and agenda review. Um, just on, on those lines, I know we've got a couple of people here for specific items on the agenda. We'll try to move you up in the agenda to take care of you guys. It looks like there might be some folks for public comment, which we'll do in just a moment, um, unless you're here for something on the agenda, things that you want to publicly comment on that are specifically on the agenda. We'll have you wait until uh, that time in our agenda, but if you're coming to just give us a general public comment, we, we will be happy to hear from you. Um, do any of the members have anything that they want to add to or notice about the agenda tonight or anything? All right. If not, then we'll see if there's some folks for public comment. I'll just lay out the rules like we usually do. We usually limit to you to about three minutes or so. Uh, we, we generally won't respond or ask any questions, that sort of thing. We take the information from you and, and uh, make a note of it and uh, potentially we'll follow up at a later date and time if, if necessary. Um, so are there people here for public comment? We'll have you go first. So make sure to just state your name and, and uh, the reason for being here. My name is Phil O'Connell. Oh, just about everybody knows who I am. So we got to have you come up to the mic a little bit so they can pick you up for the TV. But thank you, my Phil. My name is Phil O'Connell. Thank you. And I have something for each of you. Oh, thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Do I sit here? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll keep it short and sweet. It is, in fact, a federal crime to conspire or take part in a conspiracy to deny a person their constitutional rights. And this is called prima facie evidence. I did study law. They are admitting that they have been committing this crime ongoingly for two years, and they signed it. So they are, in fact, guilty by their own words and their own signature. And I think there needs to be an investigation. I think we need to know who in town hall knew about this, who took part in it, do they have emails? It's also a crime to destroy evidence. It's also a crime called obstruction of justice. I would like to know what did you know? When did you know it? What did you do? What did you say? And what part did you play? That's about it. All right. Thank you very much. So we have a second person, I believe, for public comment. My name is Bill Elsasser of the Ann Whalen. Tentatively, I was weeding around the fountain down the street. Is it called the Switzer? Switzer? Yesterday or the day before, and I realized how slight the water flow and how archaic the uh, design of the, excuse me, I have Parkinson's, uh, how archaic the design of the fountain is. And I don't know if any of you have ever been to the University of Iowa. Its frontal space, its entrance, is, uh, comprises some uh, archaic monumentalia, and it is eerie. And this this fountain uh, comprises a similar eeriness. And I would like to suggest that some high school class, design class, or Amherst College, or even UMass, be given the uh, co perhaps competitive assignment of designing a an inexpensive but more dynamic fountain for Amherst, Massachusetts. That's about all I have. Great. Thank you. Just making a note. So next on our agenda, <clears throat> we'll skip ahead since we have some guests here today. And so we'll go into section seven, which is licenses, public way, and metered parking reservations. And so um, I think for no reason at all, I'm going to select you to come up and tell us about your event, which I understand is on our consent calendar, but we can pull it out. So if you'd want to tell us a little bit, it gives you an opportunity to, to uh, advertise, not that there's any 
new thing relative to what you're asking for from us, but it's an opportunity on, on TV to tell about your event. So if you would be so kind to introduce yourself and then tell us about your event. Sure, thanks. Hi, I'm Jen Label with Big Brothers Big Sisters of Hampshire County. And I come before you tonight to um, request some um, parking meters be bagged um, at various times for our event, Amherst Crafts on the Common. Um, and this will help us um, get our artisans in and get them unloaded quickly um, and help us set up for the craft fair and then later help us break down the craft fair by allowing artisans to get their vehicles close by and loaded quickly at the end of the show. Great. And so the date of the event is the... So it's Saturday, June 23rd, and the event runs from um, 9 to 4, but the preparation starts much earlier. It starts at 6 a.m., so we've actually requested that the meters be bagged um, the night before um, to make sure that they're free and open for the artisans the next morning. Great. So the couple of questions I'm going to ask relative to this are... Um, have you reached out to, because if I'm remembering correctly, and looking at the map. The farmer's market. The farmer's market and the, and the Lord Jeffrey Inn both. It's good to be um, aware so that they know, because they might also want to inform their overnight guests to park yes. in a different place than they might otherwise. So Sure. I did reach out to the manager of the farmer's market um, via email. I have not yet heard back, so I'll try to do that again. And... I've not yet reached out to the Lord Jeffrey Inn, but um, I'm familiar with the manager and I'd be happy to do that. Great. I, I just think that it helps sort of smooth it all. Absolutely. As far as the uh, setup and that sort of thing. And, and the request as far as actual spots that you're looking for is the same as it has been. Has that changed at all? I think so. I tried to verify the number of parking spaces um, before sending the request. Um, I think it has been different in different years, but basically I was hoping to get as much parking along either side as I could, um, again, just to expedite the process, getting people unloaded quickly and, and then allowing them to move their vehicles out of the way for others. Great, thank you. Do my colleagues have questions or comments or I want to make a motion or any of the above, Ms. Brewer? So as, as we've repeatedly asked of staff, we now have right here noted on our motion sheet that it's the exact same request mm -hmm. as 27 and previous, 2017 and previous. So that's really helpful to know because I do know that it has varied a little bit over the years, but knowing that it's been this way for a while is helpful. So did someone want to make a motion? Oh, I move to approve the reservation of metered parking spaces bordering the town common 13 on the east side of South Pleasant Street and 21 on the west side of Boltwood Avenue, both beginning at College Street and progressing north to the intersection of Spring Street beginning at 9 p.m. on Friday, June 22, 2018 to 7 a.m. Saturday, June 23, 2018 for the first five metered Parking spaces to South Pleasant Street beginning at the intersection of Spring Street moving south and the remaining metered spaces to 9 a.m. Saturday, June 23rd, 2018. And on Saturday, June 23rd, tw 20, we got a problem. I have to stop back because that should have been the, the Friday. Um, Just 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. Yeah, so actually, I guess it should be. Uh, so they're overnight until the following morning. Right. And, and then I think it, it's there's a group that go until 7 a.m. and a group that go till 9 a.m. from Friday night mm -hmm. into the next morning. And okay. then a separate block of time in the late afternoon. Would you, would you like me to clarify? It is, no. uh, as I look at it, I think it's. Just confusing. You have yeah. a. You mean um, workers from 9 yeah. p.m. the night before because they have to bag the meters before people come in to 7 a.m. and then um, re another remaining space is till 9 a.m. Right. And then f from Saturday. Well, it's. <laughs> And then on Saturday, the 23rd, it's 
three thirty to six thirty. It is confusing, but I think it's. Right. I'm wondering if there might have been a typo. Yeah, no, uh, I think it's, it's just, just awkwardly. Awkwardly. It's awkwardly worded. worded. It's, I yeah. think that what I would like to do, if um, there's agreement from all, is. Uh, if we take a recess later to look at the wording of it and to come back and um, pass it tonight with just um, revisions that we might make to clarify wording um, so that um, you don't need to stay. We, we <laughs> promise we are going to do it. Okay. But, but, yes, but I think that it needs to be worded a little bit more clearly and then uh, sure. I think it'll be easier to implement. Thanks. The goal is really to just like I said, have those spaces right at 6 a.m., make sure they're all clear, um, allow the people attending as vendors to unload quickly, open the spaces back up at 9 a.m. on the 23rd, and then later close, them, up close them off so that when the fair ends at 4, the spaces are free, people can um, move their vehicles back, load up quickly, and clear the park efficiently. Yeah. Yeah. If I might, I think we understand that. It's just we're trying to make sure that literally what our motion says is so what we're got it. So got it. maybe we would say the motion as might be slightly amended to clarify. Right. <laughs> so we'll, we'll check our, our language, but otherwise it's not, I don't think anyone has any issue with, nope. <laughs> with the request. And I, I think you are very familiar with the request. So. Yeah, no, it's a great event. We appreciate having it as part of the summer activities in town. Thank you. And, uh, we always wish great success and great weather for you for this, uh, to make it a really wonderful Thanks. event. And we appreciate your cooperation with the farmer's market. So I, okay. I can second the motion to perhaps be amended if needed. Okay. <laughs> yes, I mean, I think we could go ahead and vote that it'll be fixed later if it needs to be. I mean, the problem is we're trying to do too many things in one sentence. I mean, right. it's yeah, just it's a bad habit days. we've developed. <laughs> too many days and too many It's PMs. a bad habit we've developed when it could easily be separate sentences and right. communicate yeah. quite effectively what we know to be true from the little green and red dots. Right. It's all very straightforward. All right. So do you want to take a vote on the motion or do you want to wait? And I think we should uh, to be amended later tonight. <laughs> Does that, right. does that work for people? And we may not even need to change anything except to put like a period and a capital in there somewhere. Okay. So is, is there further discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous with one person absent. Thank you very much. Thank you all. So next we'll have our other guests come up, if you would be so kind, and to tell us about um, the reason you're here, who you are and why you're here, and then we'll... Yes our bit of business with you and give you an opportunity to but tell us a little bit about uh, why you're with us this well, evening. Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Christopher Ware. And um, I'm uh, Alex Washett. We're yep. at the Jake's Restaurants. And um, really nice to meet you all. Um, yeah, we just uh, recently acquired the uh, former bread and butter uh, restaurant space in North Amherst, Mill District. And um, we're looking to expand uh, our restaurant Jake's in Northampton um, on this side of the bridge. Yeah. So we're here to apply for the common Vic license, you know, as a first step. I've been working with uh, the, uh, uh, per the permitting um, department in order to get our ducks in a row with inspections and such. But that's about where we are. Okay. Yeah. Questions for them from uh, the board? Just a statement that uh, I've enjoyed Jake's for breakfast, Jake's for lunch in Northampton <laughs> when I've been in Northampton. and. Uh, we uh, look forward to having the same quality of establishment in, in North Amherst. Thank we, you. We plan, to much, yeah. we plan to provide that. Appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you go first? Just, um, this is a chance for a little free promo as well. So um, <laughs> I'm wondering if you want to tell us what you know, kind of what your vision is for the restaurant. Is it going to be exactly like? Northampton or yeah, yeah. same menu or do you have some other ideas or might you later um, change your hours to do more things sure. just the general vision and it gives you some 
Yeah, so um, we plan to start off with a kind of a direct a mimic of the menu, um, but we do have kind of a much larger kitchen, so we can get much more creative. And um, and the dining area really lends itself to a more kind of contemporary menu too. So we may in the future expand to try some dinners or some special events. Um, we do plan to go for a full liquor license, as we've seen that they are available within town. Um, I've, I've been working with the um, the permit department and with zoning. It could be uh, some small hurdles but they assure me that it's something we could go for down the road. Yeah. There's follow-up. Yes. So I'm, I'm noticing that your um, Common Vic's license is seven days a week, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Yes, so that's correct. Is that because it's, it's coincident with your um, other permits, but you would come back and modify? I think it's pretty easy to modify that should you want to do Yes, um, I've been made aware of the process that we'd have to go through in order to do that once we do obtain the liquor license and choose to extend our hours. Yeah, yeah. we don't uh, we don't plan on um, you know changing much uh, in the get go for at least the first year. We're really just trying to focus on you know operations and and, and mirroring the the same hours of operation that we have um, in Northampton, which is seven to three. It seems yeah. to work as a model for us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just have a couple of questions um, associated, a couple associated with the actual application we have in front of us. Is it more accurate to say Christopher Ware or Chris Ware because it says Chris Ware on our motion? And would you, what would you prefer because it says Christopher on the application? Oh, uh, Christopher is fine. Great. Yeah. So we tend, we try not to use diminutives unless people ask for them. Oh, okay. Great. And I'm sorry, and you're Alexander. Alexander. Great. Yes. Sometimes we have people in front of us who aren't on that license, which is totally fine because we really just list one person. But that way our minutes are accurate. So okay. thank you, Mr. Bachman, yeah, for course. making a note of that. And the other thing, while I want to enthusiastically welcome you to Amherst, and we're really <laughs> thrilled you. that the space is going to be reprogrammed, and we're especially thrilled it's going to be by someone with such great experience in Northampton that I think we've probably all gone to at one point or another. I do want to also say that, of course, as Obviously, you would be aware um, the liquor license is a separate conversation that oh, is yes. not automatic. And oh, so yes, of course. Oh, we oh, look forward to a, having that yeah. conversation with you when you're ready. For sure. when you're ready. And we look forward to that. Yes, yes, yes. And I'm glad that you've already been working closely enough with staff to understand like when you want to have a special dinner, uh, what you need to do in order to do right. that. Definitely. So that'll be yeah. great. Yeah. Mr. Bachman, did you have something? I, when do you think you'll be open? We're shooting for maybe soft openings in August and hopefully full swing for September once all the students come back into town. That's, uh, that's what we're shooting for. Fantastic. Yeah. It's great to have you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah, we're really we're, glad, really to, be glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're it's excited about the opportunity. It's yeah. beautiful. It's three years old. It's modern. It's, it's yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, and everyone, everyone we've met here in town has just been really warm and, and very, you know, Super kind and generous and supportive. And we're just, yeah. it's, a, it's a great you know, kind of welcome feeling that we've gotten here so it's yeah, yeah good to hear yeah, it certainly has been. It's a nice town right <laughs> and i might mention work well that uh population is about to increase in their neighborhood yes it is yes it is yeah with the development across the street it's actually going to be pretty hopefully pretty good for us mm -hmm. and yeah. for north amherst you know a lot of workers it's a great area oh yes. it's true <laughs> that's true yeah. and then 140 apartments in about 18 months or something like that so right. yeah it should be good yeah yeah it's an exciting time up there yeah it is absolutely yeah. great is there further question or comment for this? Would someone like to make the motion? I move to approve the application of Jake's Eggs, Inc. doing business as Jake's for a common vitular license to operate on the premises of 68 Coles Road, seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Christopher Ware, manager slash co-owner. Is there a second? Second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that's unanimous with one member absent. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, really appreciate it. Thank you, Sam. So now we've jumped a couple of hoops there. We'll go back to our sort of regular agenda order that we typically follow. <clears throat> and so next up is uh, on our action discussion items 4A, which is the Mill Street Bridge uh, project update. Mr. Mooring is here to walk us through that a little bit and then there'll be some additional Mill Street related topics. <clears throat> S 
So in your packet, I believe you have um, the really complicated mass highway drawings with all the mm -hmm. details for unreadable. To, yeah, uh, the fonts aren't aren't small enough. I mean, it's just it's actually very very good there. I, I mean, you could actually build a bridge with those. So right. if you wanted to. Read it. So um, <clears throat> the contractor ETNL has moved on site. They moved on site last week. Uh, they're starting to get ready to close the bridge permanently tomorrow. The fences will go up and the bridge will be closed and they'll start work shortly thereafter. So the work is to take out the existing bridge, to put in a larger bridge. If you look at the profile on the first sheet, it does show that the new bridge is about 57 feet long, so it is longer. The length is to accommodate the stream and the river below, so we can do away with the scourish conditions we have at the old bridge. Um, and then we have it laid out as a one travel lane for vehicles and a multi-use path. So that was approved. Mm -hmm. There will be some need to, at some point for the select board to make the final determination about it's officially one way. Mm -hmm. And we are recommending it's one way uphill or to the south. Uh, we're doing that because if you're, the side to be on is on the right side, eh, well, you're on the right side no matter which way you're going, aren't you? You would be on the, the west side, and if you actually were to lose control, you can go into the wooded area around here in the curve. If we went downhill, and the sidewalk would be, excuse me, you go uphill this side, and the sidewalk is on here. So if you lost control, you would go off into the woods. You wouldn't cross the sidewalk. If you actually changed the direction and went downhill, the natural side for the sidewalk is on the west side. If you lost control going down the hill, you'd careen across the sidewalk. So that was one of the reasons for doing it. Mm -hmm. The other reason was we were told a lot of people like to stand on the bridge and look at the waterfall. So having the multi-use path on the dam side accommodates people for looking at the waterfall without standing in the drive in the travel lane of vehicles. So that's why it was set up that way. Mm -hmm. um, so work is will begin next. Work in earnest will begin next week, I assume. Um, they're just closing it off this week and doing some other prep work. So. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Length, length of time of construction. The contract is for one year. Mr. Steinberg. <clears throat> I was just curious as to whether there are any um, engine, traffic engineering reasons or state law reasons why um, one way is required for a one lane bridge because I know of plenty of places in the country where there are one lane bridges that people just alternate direction on. That's correct, but most of those bridges, it's one way all the way at the bridge. So you got to turn it on. You got it. So usually, usually what happens in that case is this is the bridge right here. It would be two ways on both sides and only one way across the bridge. So we're proposing that it's be one way all the way up to State Street and that there be a multi-use path all the way across the bridge and up to State Street. If you were to do something like that, you'd have to have some, uh, you'd have to have some type of signalization to make sure everyone gets across and it's clear and then, so that's why we didn't do it that way. So to follow up on that just a little bit with the multi-use, <clears throat> excuse me, with the multi-use path, um, is all of that part of the, the Mass DOT project or is it just the bridge part itself and the rest of it is our project? The Mass DOT project, let me move a little bit. So the multi-use path on the bridge project will start here at this driveway mm -hmm. and will end right here. And then we'll pick up the rest. Um, Mr. Steinberg's question reminded me, I know um, along the way that conversations come up, been brought up about the two-way alternating or not, and um, it was my understanding that while that is done and can be done, and Hadley just had that during a construction, it's really not a good thing to do. Not only is it the difference that you described, but um, I know for some people, the fact that it's going to be one way has been they've expressed how inconvenient that is because you have to circle. But um, I, 
understood and actually believe that alternating is really not the safest, most prudent way to set this up. So in addition to what you described, and if you want to comment on that. If you, if you were to do it that way and still have pedestrian and bicycle use of this area, it would make it a much more, much more difficult area to traverse. So this is a highly used pedestrian bicycle area in the summer. And to have two-way traffic and the bicycles and pedestrians, it just will just kind of make it really a lot more difficult. If you had a straight bridge, you had no, this curve right here, this blind curve also causes a great deal of concern as drivers zip around as it used to before the bridge was closed. Um, if those weren't there, then having maybe an alternating at the bridge would be fine, but you put all these things together, the blind curve, the pedestrians and bicyclists trying to use this as well, you actually add a lot of confusion that makes it more difficult to have an alternating bridge there. And, and the reason I wanted to follow up a little is, you know, we're out and about and people ask us, hey, why did they do that? And I, I wanted it to be this other one and it's, it's good for us to have some um, true but you know, factual responses so we can explain it in just layperson's terms yes. so because people ask us these things. Uh, I, I'm convinced that with the, uh, when, when you pointed out about the multi-use path, that that creates um, a distinction from any place that I've ever seen where it's been a workable, and I have seen places where it's been workable, but um, as you point out, this would not be one of them. Yeah, so are you, you're satisfied? Yes, yes we yeah. were. Uh, along those lines, it would be different if this bridge just went to a neighborhood that was a neighborhood that the same people had lived there 50 years and it was just inconvenient for them to now get out of their house. But while it is certainly inconvenient for some people and has been in variations over the last several years, we have new users here all the time. And so that, that helps me adjust my head around all of this too because we will have so many visitors and people who don't normally drive down that way and it'll be a new multi-use path etc so it, it it's not just the same five people using that that direction all the time so this will be this is um for your consideration not to dis to decide tonight but in context of a larger sort of traffic pattern that we'll be talking about on as a next agenda item that you'll take into consideration um, not f because the bridge construction will take some time, mm -hmm. there'll be some time to digest what it's going to look like. So these things are sort of connected as well. So unless there's other... The bridge is connected to the road, which is connected to the traffic pattern. Mm -hmm. yes. So Mr. Moore? I, I, and then if you also get asked the question, why don't you just use the wooded land beside it to open it up? Mm -hmm. That is conservation land on the corners. So. This, this corner here is conservation land, and this corner on this side of the bridge is conservation land. So in order to do that, because of the way the state has it, the, we have to go to the legislature to get that removed, and we have to replace that conservation land. So it wasn't an easy fact of just also to widen the bridge out. That was another issue that was discussed. Another question. Uh, how long has the br bridge been closed already? I believe we closed it in 2012. So anything open will be an improvement from people. Yes. <laughs> Leave it closed long enough. Proved over <laughs> nothing. Yeah. Take it away long enough. Right. I think, you know, my thought about it one way is just given the, typically when you have a, a single lane but two directional bridge, it's a very, very low volume, usually very rural circumstance. And while, um, and this just doesn't satisfy that, especially when you get the multi-use path, I think. So. Especially in the summer. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I don't want to get into grand debates on this, but I do know of two circumstances where there are crossings of the Erie Canal in an urban area with fairly heavy traffic, and it is that way. But I don't think they're analogous for the reasons that Mr. Mooring has already stated, and I think that's a very important point. So are there other questions about the bridge proper? If not, we'll ask Mr. Mooring to take us into our next agenda item, which is the, the uh, first look at, at uh, Mill Street and State Street traffic patterns, which is sort of building off of the bridge project, pardon the pun. 
So when the Public Works Committee started talking about the bridge and aligning the bridge and how to change the bridge when it was closed, at that, that time the Conservation Department was also going through their um, Puffers 2020 study. So there was a lot of people who were talking about what to do about Puffers Pond and improving Puffers Pond who also came. One of the issues was, was more pedestrian access around Puffers and from the bridge and tying the two, the South Beach and the North Beach together. So a concept came up and it was kind of tossed around and then recently we've started tossing this concept around again. And this is just a concept, um, and this is just to get us started and to talk, start talking about it. What we would do is we would um, take State Street, over here's, the, over here's the bridge, this is Mill Street, comes into State Street. Uh, this would be one way, and then State Street would be two way for a short period because we have to access this one driveway, this house um, 172 State Street only has one driveway now and it is off of State Street now. Um, and then but once we get past this driveway, we make the, the road that runs along Puffers Pond and through this area one way. Um, we would move the parking to the right. We would make it one way to the north, kind of northeast. Um, and that way we could uh, make it a little more, a little calmer, a little safer. Right now it's two lane traffic. Um, there's approximately, um, there is parking on the, on this side here. Actually, that's the north side. There's no parking on the left side along the, along the pond. So if we move and we stripe it the way it's striped now, we have 36 existing spaces and we drop down to 29 spaces, supposedly. To count spaces, we had to choose a number. We chose 22 feet as a space. But when you're out at Puffer's Pond, there are no spaces marked out. People park as close as they want to. So even if we change it, they'll still be able to park as close as they want to in this section. Um, we came up to the, uh, this is the access to the beach where the handicapped spaces are. We chose to take this whole section and do away with the parking because this is uh, the point where people access emergency vehicles or any other type of vehicle that maintenance vehicles would access the beach, the south beach from this area. So we got rid of all the parking. This is the parking on the bridge. We took that parking out. Um, there are some little structural issues with the, the bridge, uh, bridge um, abutments and the wing walls around the culverts there that um, we thought if we move traffic to the middle and got rid of parking on the sides, that might help it for us. So they have walkways on both sides of the bridge and then traffic through the middle. Um, you do lose eight spaces. There's 10 all together right now. You keep the two handicapped spaces and you lose the other ones. As you go up, you cross the bridge. Uh, we looked at getting away from having parking on the river side. That's to help stabilize the banks and make the river better. And we uh, put angle in parking along this side, the north side. And then we still keep it one way um, there are two handicapped spaces here which would stay. Um, we would go up through this area here, it's very tight. The trees don't allow you to have angle in parking. Uh, we shifted the road over and then we start having angle parking on this side. We continue that angle parking all the way up to about this point and that fits now. If you're at State Street and you're walking, these are the areas where the boulders are on the right side of the road as you're heading towards bridge. Um, there's a line of boulders and there's a couple trees and another line of boulders. We would push those boulders back and allow you to angle in parking there. Once you get to the, um, so roughly there's 70 spaces along this area here now because people can park on both sides. We restrict parking to one side. You get 40 spaces out after that. Once we get to this point, here, past the angle parking, we go back to parallel parking on one side only, because it's we're making it one way. Um, they're parking on the pavement, and then we put in a turnaround. So the one way will end at this point. This is roughly about 200, 300 feet from the railroad bridge. Uh, this turnaround is to accommodate the people who live on State Street on the north end of the railroad bridge. They have two-way traffic, and we didn't want to take away their two-way traffic from them. So if a delivery truck or someone who's not familiar with the area came down from this area, they can come down, turn around, and head back out without going one way down the road. 
So in this section, there's about 56 spaces that exist, and there are 30 of those spaces that would remain. So this is kind of what we're proposing. There's been some comments about how what to do for pedestrians. We've talked about taking the travel way, which in most cases is shown on here being 14 feet, and striping it for as 10 feet and having a four foot area for people to walk that's sort of striped that way. This is a walking area, this is the travel way, and this is the parking area. So there's all sorts of little concepts we're talking about. There's been some discussion about two-way bicycling and how we would accommodate that, which uh, gets a little tighter. We have, to do some, we have to do some innovative things to accommodate that as well. But that's our proposal, and it is, is the start of this conversation. Um, the Transportation Advisory Committee has seen it, and the Conservation Commission has seen it as well but we want to kind of talk about this. The time period is, is that we would talk about it and maybe have something that we can install for September before the student, around the students return after the season's over, and then it'd be in full operation for the next, the next beach season. So just to add to that, the um, assistant town manager, the superintendent of public works, and the police chief and fire chief, and I all worked, walked the entire area mainly to talk about the public safety uh, requirements that the police and fire thought they had to address. They wanted to have addressed as we started to think through this. And in addition, uh, we wanted to have the least intrusive kind of uh, change so that maintain the entire road maintained its sort of rural character, which is really kind of a special part of that road, but try to accommodate as many parking spaces as we could. Um, right now, it's you know if you drive up there in the summer, it's very dangerous. I think, and that's why one of the things that um, we are trying to address with this this accommodation. Ms. Brewer. So you know that one of the first questions is going to be about parking spaces, and all the people who like to imagine people are going to stop driving cars, but we know that's not happening immediately. Are we really talking about a net loss of 64 spaces? Um, if you can't consider a space to be 22 feet, yes. And what is our theory as to what we're doing with all those people? Since obviously not every space is in use all the time now, but sometimes they are. And so that's a lot of cars. We don't, we don't see much parking up towards the, the, other, the upper end in this area. So, so this, that's not feeling like as big of an impact That's in that not used 100% of used the time. Much. There, there could be some spillage, and we've talked about there might be spillage on the other side of State Street. Um, there's only, there's no parking on one side of that side of State Street already, um, but we have, we have thought about that. We are a little concerned. Stiff. Yes. Sort of like when you squeeze the eclair, it kind of goes somewhere. Um, so we are a little concerned of that. Screw. Well, I, I mean, I had, I had that concern, and it sounds like you're not going to stripe the spaces because you want it to be like if there's a bunch of small cars maybe you get it and people are reasonable about how they pull in and a large RV thing but I'm wondering if there's any opportunity um, to have like an overflow flow space that's maybe a little further but it's like everything's full but if you know if you go just a little further just in for 20 more cars but not necessarily a lot I mean that kind of squeezing the eclair but you got to walk a little further, and I'm wondering. Also, um, I know we're, you know, this is just the concept kind of thing, so we're not we're not going to pick on it too much. But the signage, because if we're going to do this, um, we have to have a way to make it clear to people what the new rules are, and think about how we're going to enforce it. Because my limited experience on the parking committee, without the accompanying signage and enforcement, and then that gets into the sort of rural character. Because once you start putting in the lines and showing that the other handicapped ones are handicapped and you do know that it, it's not going to be as rural, but it's going to be safer. So you're balancing safety and economy with, you know, the way it used to be, you know, when I started going there 50 years ago and it was like totally funky and that's kind of the charm, but it doesn't work with 90 cars there. We've thought about that and it is a delicate situation. We've talked about just reducing the signage, keeping it as low as we can and doing more pavement striping on, on the road so that people can see what's on the road. Um, so things like that will probably be used more than actually just trying to put signs up that are there all the time. Park at your own risk kind of <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Steinberg. 
So I have two different things, but I'll stick with parking first. Um, is there any concern that on the busiest days uh, when Puffer's Pond is having the highest demand, that there'll be parking going up Sand Hill Road and what the consequences of that might be if it were to happen? We, we've kind of floated that idea too. Um, we, it might happen. It, Sand Hill is a little harder to park on and people may not want to park on it because of the steepness of the hill. We're, we're thinking more it'd be State Street that gets more parking on it than mm -hmm. the other side of State Street will get much more parking than Sand Hill. But then again, we're open to look at it. If we actually were to do this, we are taking the low, low key, low tech approach. So if it, I, we decided to change it and the only thing that would be there that's not there now would be this turnaround at the very end. That would be the only thing we have to build to accommodate this type of trial. We can paint out the other lines and get rid of them if we need to, if it doesn't really function well, but we think it'll, we think this will do it. Just, we're sort of sharing some brainstorming. Um, the low tech, low messaging, using striping. There may be some ways with some uh, landscape architecture um, thinking to use some landscaping to also demark and suggest to people, I know it's less of the, you know, just strewn boulder look, but, it, you know, some planting areas or some other use of stone and whatever to, that match materials that are there to help guide people um, to where they're supposed to go. And it, it, it is more of a, a little bit more built environment, but matching materials that are around there, small trees, whatever, to add to that. So my other issue, and I, uh, Mr. Zemek might help me with this one, but um, if I am visualizing this correctly, where you have on the lower, the bump out of the uh, lower part of the road as we're looking at it with the two handicapped places, that's where uh, the Robert Frost Trail comes in on one side, I believe. Uh, it's, yeah, it's locally called the Kevin Flood Trail. Yeah. It goes over the Robert Francis Bridge. So there are two handicapped spaces there because yeah. um, technically it is an ADA trail. Um, so it's crushed stone, be. TRG. Yeah, it's still in yeah. pretty good shape. Yeah. So it's, but it is marked as the Robert Frost Trail. And then the Robert Frost Trail continues just before the bridge um, that's to the left there, right. which means you're going to get a lot of people walking with kids who are going to be going through that area that has a lot of parking places there. Um, what are the safety factors for people with or without young kids walking the Robert Frost Trail along there? I think that's a great point and it's good feedback for us to take tonight. As Guilford said, this is, mm -hmm. you know, he and I have been talking about this for over five years. As Mr. Bachman said, we, we did a walk around with, with public safety, all of us, and, and Guilford's team designed this. Um, but no, we need to look at where people are going. What are the desire lines out there? Uh, if they're coming down the Robert Frost from the east, and cutting over at the Kevin Flood Trail and then going around the perimeter trail, as, as Mr. Steinberg said, um, we need to look at that. And, and our people are gonna be backing out of there. Um, as Mr. Mooring said earlier, we, we, we want to try to achieve a walking path, a safe walking path on one side, preferably the pond side of State Street. And we haven't quite achieved that yet. We run into some wetlands, we run into slope, Mm -hmm. um, it gets a little more challenging. I will say that I look at this as an incremental change. Um, you may recall, as, as Mr. Mooring said, uh, the Puffer Spawn 2020 group looked very extensively at the parking issue, and what they concluded was, um, uh, you know, simply the road and the pond has exceeded its carrying capacity. And this is an incremental way, even if we shrink parking a little bit, uh, we, we also talked about uh, adding more bike racks. There's only one bike rack at Puffer's Pond. There should be multiple bike places for people to leave bicycles. Again, I, I, I respect Ms. Brewer's com uh, comment about, you know, people aren't gonna necessarily change overnight their, their, their driving habits, but 
um, we do need to bring the parking and the safety issues under control. And I look at this as, as an incremental um, in keeping with the rural road solution. I will say that Puffers Pond 2020 actually came up with a proposal to put, I'm going to say, a, pointer. a fifth. He's a pointer. Oh, yeah. A 50 to 65, I think is my recollection, uh, uh, sp space parking area up here in the woods. So I think that's a more impactful solution, um, but it's something we could look at in the future if these more subtle, um, you know, incremental steps don't work. Well, just to play devil's advocates, sort of doing that all day, um, having that almost as overflow, because, you know, designing for the three hottest, heaviest use days might be overkill, but there are different materials for um, overflow parking for that kind of event where when it finally pushes to that, you have that there, but it's still kind of grassy. You know, there's different materials. The problem with incremental is then you have to come back in 10 years and make another change and another change. There's, there's a part of me that's like, figure it out, do a really good design, do it once. People hate it for two days because it's a change, and then you're done. And like, instead of a little pain, a little pain, oh, now we're changing it. I mean, having a really good plan and really executing it, and then I mean, not that you don't always have to revisit stuff, but it's, there's something about the incremental, like, you know, a toe in boiling water, and then you're, you know. And again, I would also add having some landscape architecture um, ideas integrated into how we do this, not just the engineering part. Totally appreciate those comments. I will say that this is with almost no budget as well. To do a parking lot here, you're probably talking about a couple hundred thousand dollars so and maybe then, you demark that as the future overflow so that right. people know that that's in the plan and then you, you know. We also think that these modest improvements and changes to parking um, will be received better by the Conservation Commission, but to actually do a parking lot there is a pretty substantial, if we're doing it all on conservation land versus this is mostly in the public way, and then slightly beyond. Now again, Buffer Spawn 2020 did talk about that. Again, I will say, and I was fully supportive of us looking at a parking fee uh, down the road as well. Um, at the time, five, seven years ago, we were squarely looking at that uh, to try to fund some of the improvements up there. Um, we can't charge a fee for entrance to Buffer Spawn, but we can, uh, according to town council, charge a parking fee um, for for uh, parking up there. So in any event, it's something to look at. I can just add one more, probably not very PC remark. Um, I don't like providing inadequate parking as a way to somehow theoretically force people to use their bike more. I mean, I mm -hmm. think if people are gonna access this by vehicles, then we have to think of a way to make that work <coughs> and it's all a compromise. But the idea that, well, if, if you take away half the parking, more people will bike, just right. that just doesn't work it wasn't for me. Really, but I do yeah. support yeah. charging for parking. It's a yeah. public resource. I wasn't really implying that. No. What I was saying is Good. to design for three to five peak days yeah. in the right. summer, that I get. Yeah. it's a lot of yeah. impact yeah. for three to five it's full days. That, that I understand. So, so the city's been struggling with Walden Pond with this, this exact same thing, and they, they could have ac acres and acres of parking, but right. they specifically limit the number of cars because they, the pond can only handle right. so many so cars. The yeah. And then what happens is it fills up at a certain time, and they put out the word, it's filled up, it won't reopen until 3 p.m. And so um, there's a lot of resource, public resources like this that struggle with over subscription and while they could build more parking to accommodate all the cars it would be worse for the, the for, for the pond itself and so i think that's something we don't we don't know what that number is for how many cars people should be using it maybe we do maybe puffer spawn 2020 has it but i think that's sort of the starting point like how many cars do we want to have So along those lines, I guess one of the things I would ask you to think about, as I know you've already thought about in so many ways, is if all the parking spaces we had now, quote unquote, that people are theoretically using on perhaps those three hottest days, is that too many in terms of impact on the pond? Because we don't have a way of saying the pond's closed. We don't, it isn't like Mill River Recreation Area where people go there to play baseball, tennis, walk on the trails, use the pool. 
use the pavilion. And if it overflows in terms of parking, yes, then you're kind of stuck and you have to take the bus, basically. But there's still capacity there for all those things. There, there is still space left for humans to appropriately use the materials that are there, even if all the parking spaces are filled up. That may not be true mm -hmm. with Puffer's Pond. It may be, as you say, that really this is the appropriate limit to protect the pond. Mm -hmm. The difficulty I run into beyond figuring out a parking scheme that's going to work for people is that Puffer's Pond has sometimes felt like it's become some people's park that go there all the time regularly and is maybe not feeling as accessible to some of the rest of the community when they move in, when they try and go there at a particularly busy time, and it feels like it's not their place to go. And so I want to be somehow address that, and we're going to lose at least 30 parking spaces of probably regularly used spaces. I mean, we'll have to come up with that number, but because you're saying that some of those weren't actually used. But of the net loss of the quite large number, then you're actually, you know, at 64. Maybe it's not 64, maybe it's 35. But that's huge for but not just three hot days, but 20 the hot summer. days in the summer. And so I hope that we can find a way to continue to talk to the community about this so it doesn't feel like it's excluding people who don't get there at the crack of opening time. <laughs> and then it's just their backyard for the rest of the day, and the rest of the community can't use it. I'm not saying there's a magical answer. Yeah, so um, I think what it speaks to is that it will have to be more actively managed, and and that's... You know, that's what other places do is they they put out the word through Twitter and Facebook and every and on their websites that we're at capacity now we're at 80% capacity for parking areas and people are alert alerted to that um, but it takes it will require some active management the other thing I hope that this addresses is I mean we, we all drive through there that people are walking in the middle of the road and mm -hmm. people are dri trying to drive at the same time with little kids dragging stuff it's, I think, just don't think that that's a very safe type Great. of thing works in P-Town. And, and um, I, I think was, I had to go back and listen to Mr. Zemek probably knows what I'm referring to, but a lot of people from Cushman and the immediate surrounding areas walk mm -hmm. on a trail that starts fairly near to the Cushman General Store across the, just across the Cushman Common. Starts at the railroad track and goes down, and um, they use that as their way to get to the pond, and um, that's why I was worried about the traffic route also, uh, because we don't want to make it more difficult for people to walk to the pond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are two two trails that come down from Cushman, well, kind of one from Pine Street, and then one from further out near the railroad tracks, and we can look at that, Mr. Mooring, and I can look at that as well. Correct. I did just want to point out that we're actually not talking about the only parking at Puffer's Pond on State Street because there is the parking for the North Beach and then there's additional informal parking along Mill Street. Um, there's a pull in there that can probably accommodate 10 and then the, the parking lot up at the North Beach, I don't have the number right off the top of my head but I'm going to say it's 12 to 15 there. Um, that was created I believe after the last dredging about probably 17, 18 years ago. Um, and we've talked about, again, Puffer's Pond 2020 looked into whether we could increase the size of the parking lot in the old gravel pit. Um, I did just want to comment on Mr. Balkman's point. I, I couldn't agree more that in the future we are going to have to um, act more actively manage uh, Puffer's Pond. And to some degree, it's kind of back to the future. We used to do that. Um, but back in about 2006, 2007, when budgets were very tight, we eliminated the funding for um, for that. Um, we, we had that coverage at that time from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. throughout the summer. Um, so uh, we certainly know what those numbers are. I just wonder, while you're tossing all these um, ideas around, maybe looking at charging for the parking, um, whether it's meters, and if that would support the parking enforcement that would have to go with it and still generate enough additional income that could be dedicated to things like managing the pond or other improvements to the pond where the money collected there is dedicated to the pond, but to cover somebody actually walking up and down for those meters for 
you know, from Memorial Day to Labor Day, because to me, the trade-off of paying for parking and getting to use that resource is quite fair. And then maybe, you know, I have no idea how the money works out, but maybe that would help with the active, some of the active management, which I think it's probably time to mm -hmm. provide. Well, for, for Respond uh, 2020 recommended a um, resident fee and a non-resident fee. So you could buy a season pass. And then many state parks now have solar, um, solar uh, powered pass uh, 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 ticket booths, if and you will. And They're very, very right. subtle. And I'm actually and, thinking of metered yeah. parking, but that's a different way of looking at yeah. it. The use so. pass. Good. So you're thank laughing because you. you know how popular. So in in, in my pr prior employment, my previous town, Manchester, they now. They started with a fee of one dollar for anybody to walk onto the beach, and it had to apply to everybody. And now it's up to seven dollars to walk onto the beach for anybody to walk on. Mm -hmm. um, but town residents can buy a season pass for like twenty dollars or something like that. So you get a little mm -hmm. little tag that you slip, you right. tag. But um, but that's to sort of all the out of towners who come in. They were trying support, to support, but somebody has to be there. That's they, the they, it's an they actual pay for collection person. system. Yeah. But weren't we told we couldn't charge admission? I mean, it, that's in, that's interesting and useful information, but we can't simply apply that because I believe we were just told we can't charge admission to the pond. We can only charge for parking. That's my understanding from Copeland and Page. Yeah. So different historical mm -hmm. ways of doing things yeah, that we may would, or may not agree with. That but. person would be collecting parking fees instead of park fees mm -hmm. or beach fees. For right. They, they collect parking fees too. Right. <laughs> they do both. <laughs> There's more than one way to. Good, thank you. So, Damn. are there other questions or comments for? Looking forward sure. to it coming back again. It, absolutely, yes. Can we migrate to one thing that's in your packet? And this is a letter you received of, about the dam, the dike. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure people understand what that letter mm -hmm. references. So because it's right. different than what yeah. most people think because of the terminology that was used sure, in that letter. Could, um, yeah. Do you have, we have our two experts here anyway? First. Right. Um, yes. So I think we'll be fairly brief on this because I know you have a long agenda. Um, Mr. Mooring and I can stick around for a few minutes to talk about this. But um, yes, the, the letter that we received from the Department of Conservation and Recreation Office of Dam Safety refers to the dike. There's a dam, of course, that we all know. And then there's a dike, which is to the east of Mr. Sharkin's property at Mill Street, number 64, the house. And that is an earthen structure that was built many, many years ago as part of the retention of water in, um, in this old mill pond. And as the letter indicates, now what's interesting is in the front page, the first page, it says dike. Then throughout the rest of the document, it vacillates between dike and dam, and I think that confuses a lot of people. They're clearly talking about the dike. And the, the dam itself, we have, um, in, um, inspected on a regular basis. Uh, the town engineer is part of that process. We test the, uh, the uh, emergency uh, outflow of the, of the pond regularly. I believe it's every two years we have it inspected by an engineer. The dike um, is on a different schedule. And yes, in 2016, Office of Dam, Dam Safety did receive a report that indicates there are some inadequacies in that dike, some undercutting of the bank, uh, essentially, uh, the, the, the guidance or requirement for a dike is not a dissimilar to what we do at many of our reservoirs. Uh, the state would not uh, want trees to grow into that earthen structure. That can undermine the structural integrity of, of that structure. So uh, I've already reached out to Mr. Sharkin. We plan to meet. Uh, we believe we have an easement to maintain that. Um, and it would re require uh, some removal of trees and perhaps some armoring of that, of that dike. So I wanted to assure you and the public that we are on top of that and we will be working with an engineering firm uh, and my staff uh, with guidance from the town engineers on how to proceed with that. But the dam is safe, the dike is not compromising the safety of Puffer's Pond or those people downstream at this time. I appreciate you stating that since the letter actually indicates otherwise. And so the letter's not in our packet, and so that I know it was emailed to us ahead of time, but it's not in here. Yeah. Um, and so maybe we could have it in our next packet with 
a memo that basically just says those few sentences. The We're working on it. We're fully aware of what the circumstances are here. And that way it's together so that that letter's not just floating around out there in the ether by itself because like many things, they make it sound scary, when, just like when we do statement of interest for the schools. We make it, it sounds really bad, but um, we, are, we have things under control and a memo that would be on top of that, um, I think would be very helpful to have together in our next packet. And then we don't have to go over it again, but that way they travel together <laughs> as they go through the universe. And then someday you'll give us another update. So. If I could point out that in the letter, um, which I believe you did receive we got electronically, it has images, and you'll notice that the images look nothing like the dam. Um, it's an earthen dike, right. and it shows some trees. It shows some uh, some uh, animal burrows. You know, uh, chipmunks, woodchucks, uh, mammals that burrow into the soil, and then it shows some some uh, minor undercutting. Uh, this was during the drought of 2016, so the water level of Puffer's Pond was very low. So um, the, the pictures reveal that. Um, but it's clear it is not the dam, it is the dike. Mr. Sessions. Just real quick, could you use the pointer and point to where the North Beach is and where the dike is so that we're all clear? Um, so this is the Sharkin property. Yeah. Um, you continue, uh, I guess that's west, west? Northwest. Northwest. And this is the entrance to the North Beach parking area, right up here, where I indicated there's probably a dozen uh, or so parking spaces. The North Beach is way up here. And then along Mill Street, there are some informal parking air, uh, spaces here, probably right. eight to 10. And then the dike is over here. The dam is right here. Of course, the bridge that Mr. Mooring was just talking about. Um, this is one of our structures for um, um, releasing water and testing the, the emergency uh, um, uh, structure of the dam. And then these are the cliffs. Um, this looks like the, uh, the little um, dock that Mr. Sharkin has. And then the dike is right in this area right here. Great. Thank you. If that's helpful. Other Good. questions Thank or you. comments for the just if we could plan to have that next week's packet, I think that'd be super helpful yeah, so that we can point right at it and say, it's all okay. Good idea. Right. Part of why the letter itself didn't go, because it couldn't get the accompanying <laughs> description with it. Reassurance. Thank you. So if there aren't other questions about the bridge, traffic in and around the bridge and or the dike near the bridge so just to reiterate that those changes aren't going to happen for the summer <clears throat> we'll right. continue to work on it through the summer and present to you with a plan to be implemented in the fall and then we'll have the winter to live with it and see how it works and then right. be ready to go yeah. right and if memory serves we have to have a public hearing yes. about some of it mm -hmm. so we'll have to notice that appropriately and all of those yeah. sort of things so Mr. Morning, thank you very much. Um, so next on our agenda is a projects update from, from Mr. Zomek about a variety of projects. And so if you would like to, to take us through those, and I think there was a series of maps and or pictures. Or C. Just the one? Oh, no, no, no. That one, that one also goes okay. with this group. There's oh, one other one. Okay. Is there another one? He's got pictures of all of them. Right. They are not. I know that in our packet, I'm just double checking here. I know that there were two pieces. One had the label of 4C on it, which was a single sheet of paper that's about the dog park. The other and the other one is this one that has oh, the, the, oh, the, high school. the the Weston oh, and Sampson yeah, no, recreation no. things. So yeah, and then the dog park right now. Yeah. and on the back of that is Groff. So it's got. All sorts of stuff connected. Oh, <laughs> yeah. To oh, go right ahead. Good proceed. Again, thank you for having me to talk about these four exciting projects. Um, what I'd like to do is is run through just a very short series of slides. I think I I have one per per project. I think maybe what I'll do is pause between projects if you have questions or 
go through all four projects. It's really, I would look to the chair okay. on that. So starting off, the Amherst uh, Dog Park. Um, as you know, um, the, the Dog Park Task Force has been meeting for many months, and we looked at a number of different sites throughout Amherst, and um, uh, after a thorough search of both public and private land, we landed uh, on the old landfill. And just to orient folks, um, this is uh, Belchertown Road, Route 9, headed toward Belchertown. And uh, I'm sorry, um, that is over uh, here. And then coming off uh, Route 9 is Old Belchertown Road here. And so this is a small corner of the old landfill. This is the landfill on the south side of Route 9. Um, and what we have before you is a conceptual design done by Berkshire Design Group out of Northampton. Uh, they uh, volunteered to produce this concept design that we could submit to the Stanton Foundation. They are the uh, group that funds both dog parks and uh, um, um, they, they fund um, dogs and, and uh, safety equipment for canines used by police departments all over Massachusetts and in other states. And so what, what we've put together with, with lots of input and lots of feedback from the task force is about a two acre site with a large dog area and a small dog area, a central uh, entrance and receiving area here with about 20 uh, spaces right on the road frontage on uh, Old Belchertown Road. The site was selected for its access to Route 9, um, the fact that it has uh, virtually no direct or close neighbors, um, that it was already owned by the town and would not need to be acquired, and that we felt as though with some um, due diligence that we could get through the, the complex permitting process that um, uh, putting an old uh, putting a, a dog park on a landfill would require. So um, as you know, we are also moving forward with the solar project on the new landfill, on the north landfill, and the remainder of this site will need to be used as mitigation for uh, loss of habitat for a rare state-listed species. Uh, Stephanie Ciccarello and I have already met with the state folks at the uh, Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. We have walked the site with them and they feel as though that this is a permittable use and a, uh, a reasonable use, uh, given that we are setting aside the remainder of the, uh, the old landfill for uh, grassland birds. So at this point, we have a budget, we have a conceptual design, and we are finalizing our grant to the Stanton Foundation, um, which uh, the, the first grant or the first application will be for a design grant to fully design it, uh, and then we, um, in all likelihood, would then proceed for a construction grant. Uh, Stanton will fund grants up to about 225,000 for uh, construction. And as you all recall, um, town meeting, uh, annual town meeting did authorize $90,000 in CPA funds to be used uh, in part for construction, but in part for the due diligence. We would need to survey out this lot we would uh, also need to do work with the DEP on a reuse study for the site to make sure, of course, that it is safe for humans and dogs to use. What we know about this site, working with Mr. Mooring and his staff, is that um, it is part of the landfill, but it was the stump dump. So this area of the landfill was primarily used for organic material, and it does not contain trash. The uh, trash is actually in uh, farther to the west up in another cell. So that's where we are. Uh, we hope to be um, hearing from the Stanton Foundation. They usually uh, let people know within about 30 to 45 days. And we hope uh, to get a design grant and be designing this park to bid out uh, in the fall. Uh, it will take some coordination with the Natural Heritage Program because there will be a number of permits that will be part of the solar landfill. So we're trying to bring these two projects together. So I think I'll stop there. So the question I have um, is uh, relative to the to the you know establishment of that of the dog park. Um, do you have a sense of at this point? And I think it'd just be a back of the envelope sort of guess as to what the 
year-over-year maintenance would be, the sort of staffing that's necessary to, you know, uh, kind of cruise through, empty trash, uh, check on, you know, the, the water supplies that are there working properly, making sure the fencing is in good order again. Because, you know, if things get used and get used a lot, then there's maintenance that needs to happen, sort of what the estimates are for sort of year-over-year -year, um, uh, maintenance would be like and, and how we t intend to fund that. Well, a couple of quick things. One is we're trying to build a park that is that has as minimal annual maintenance as possible. Um, we will have water on site. That was another reason that this site was uh, selected because it does have um, uh, on-street water. We would bring basically one spigot. Mm -hmm. uh, there aren't a lot of moving parts other than the water and the gates to a dog park. Um, most of the uh, features of the dog park are rather passive. Uh, it is a grassed in area. There, you'll see some of the sand mounds, again, very low maintenance, very low cost. There will be walkways around both. It does need to be ADA, and there will, one of the challenges will be shade. Uh, the, the other challenge will be um, how do we put in the fence around this, uh, given that we don't want to pierce the landfill cap? So in order to do that, one of the costs is going to be bringing up with fill uh, the parts of the, the site that need to be brought up so that fence posts can go in the ground. Um, the task force is still working on cost estimates for an annual budget. They have been reaching out extensively to other uh, dog parks uh, around the state and around the valley. Um, uh, Berkshire Design has designed a number of these. Uh, what they're planning to do is have a Friends of the Amherst Dog Park, and so they have developed a draft um, rules and regulations for the park, and they are beginning to work on uh, setting up a structure for fundraising. So their goal would be to have annual fundraisers to raise money for uh, any materials that are needed, for instance, uh, dog poop bags, et cetera. And then, um, again, we're trying to minimize the impact on say a DPW for the maintenance of this. But I will say they haven't developed all of the annual maintenance cost at this point. But you're really talking about mowing, uh, dog waste bags, um, and then you know wear and tear on, on any other moving parts. There aren't a lot of moving parts here. So just relative to our earlier conversation, those 20 spots might have meters on them. I was just thinking, <laughs> not to suggest that at this point, but talking about, you know, the park. sort of use of the park, uh, you know, and it could be a, a source of revenue to help offset the, you know, the cost. In a donation box. Right, or a donation box or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I think there'll definitely be a donation box, an annual annual uh, fundraising campaign. Right, Ms. Kerr. Yeah, I mean, if there is a way that there's an appropriate revenue stream, because otherwise all taxpayers are underwriting the dog park, um, which... Without, you know, if there's a way to generate some revenue that goes towards this. But I was wondering, just in the kind of creative idea department, um, the parking, I wonder if there's a way to put in those solar canopies like UMass has, if there's any grant money or a, a lease for generating electricity that pays for, um, it seems like since there's a sustainability element here and I'm, I'm seeing an opportunity to at least explore cost-wise and construction feasibility-wise, the uh, solar canopy. Yeah, we can look at that as a source of generating funds. Yeah, I mean, I know, know nothing about the finances yeah. of that, but it may not be a big enough area. Any other questions there? Or? Um, it totally has popped into my head, so I don't expect anybody to have an answer, but in terms of when we move forward talking, <clears throat> with people about how we're paying for things. I think we do need to be sensitive to the trash removal, which we are not always great at yeah. when it comes right down to it. And yes. it's Thank it's you. sort of off by itself, and we like to imagine that the people are going to go there, at least going to take really good care of it at the beginning. But that doesn't mean that other people won't go there and dump trash there, because other people go every place and dump trash, yeah. <laughs> including right downtown. So um, we respecting the fact that we're trying to design it the best we can to prevent that, we're still going to have to send people out to collect trash that isn't currently being collected. And other parts of town are having are struggling to have all their trash collected. So we'll have to think about that. And then in terms of the part that's, that's an ongoing issue. The part that's more popped in my head is we have very low costs for our dog licenses. Mm. And has any community tied 
a surcharge on it. I mean, there are always rules about what you're allowed to charge for things. Does it cost? And obviously, we would like some of it to go toward the animal uh, welfare officer's work, which is a ton of work in addition to physically doing things. Um, But I don't know if there is any wiggle room there associated with that Mm -hmm. that other places have been able to be creative for. Because while not everyone uses everything in town all the time, that's already true for Puffer's Pond and Mill River and everything else, if we could kind of show that dog owners are doing a thing, that might also be more interesting to people. And given that the license fee is so incredibly low for animals that have been neutered, it's like $5. It's like a ludicrously small amount of money, which is good because then people actually license their dogs. Obviously, that's why we do Mm -hmm. it. We don't charge a lot so that we actually know that dogs are licensed and they've had their shots. But there might be a place to talk about it. It, it, Probably someone else. It's like time to review it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Other questions regarding the dog park? If not, thank you. you. I I made a few notes Um, on the dog waste issue. I do appreciate those comments because right now, I think historically between the PD and and conservation, we've funded the dog waste bags and it is uh, not Mm -hmm. um, trivial what we spend on those bags per year. Now some, uh, I know Cambridge, uh, a couple of other communities have actually um, invested in there maybe some grant funding for composters so for dog waste composters um, I did have a conversation with um, Mr. Snow over the weekend I think we were at Mill River I can't remember where we were but he and I are really big advocates of um, carry in carry out the minute you put a trash a, a just mm-hmm. a broad catch-all trash can everybody trash. Um, everybody Mount Pollux we do not put out trash cans for that reason um, we have to do it at Puffers, but you're right. It's not a insignificant amount of time or energy or money to get rid of that waste. Um, so anyway, we will work with that. Um, um, Mr. Pistrang and, and the task force, very committed to this. One of the highest energy committees I've ever, or groups I've ever worked with in my time in Amherst. So they want to get this done. Moving along, Another um, exciting project and one with a lot of energy around it are the improvements to Groff Park. And what you see before you is uh, the latest um, concept that we are working through. Now, keep in mind, we have put together a team of staff composed of DPW planning and LSSC staff, as well as two LSSC commission members to work with, again, Berkshire Design. Mike Liu is the designer of the improvements at Groff Park. These include, uh, and and the drawing before you shows um, playground improvements uh, in the area where there is currently a playground, and then um, a spray park, as well as a new pavilion, walkways, and some improvements to the the, uh, parking area and a new pavilion at the lower level. Now you recall recently we did get a uh, land and water conservation grant grant, uh, from the federal government through the state government and and I think this is gonna come in very handy because what we're proposing there um, have have some some significant costs. Um, I will say that what the group is focused on are really making a welcoming, uh, fully accessible um, destination for people uh, from Amherst, throughout it'll probably be a, a bit of a regional draw. These these parks will be open to anybody without a fee. Um, they will be open longer periods, if you will, uh, in the season than I, than a pool would. They will. This park will not require a staff member to be there. Um, but we think we've got a, a, a pretty exciting concept. Um, the group uh, has met multiple times with members of the public. We did a We've done two forums at Crocker Farm School. LSSE staff went to some of the apartment complexes off of East Hadley Road and vetted some of the concepts with with folks there. Got a really warm reception, very exciting. We think this park concept goes very nicely with the CDBG work that we're gonna do on uh, East Hadley Road, expanding the sidewalk there and making some safety improvements there. Those, I'm not gonna talk about those tonight, but that project is uh, under design uh, and will be bid out later this summer. In terms of things I'd like to point out to you, um, 
we, we really, as I said, want to make this welcoming. So um, we're, we're doing a lot to make the, the approach and the entrance to this park, of course, it will be ADA. It will have uh, nice kiosks, nice benches. Uh, we have not decided on the actual features of either the, the uh, playground area or the spray park yet. That's uh, something that our group, including LSSC members, will be talking about with Mike in the, in the coming uh, days and weeks. Our hope is to have this bid out in Ju uh, late June, early July. Um, some of the features I just wanted to bring to your attention, one is this fun little feature here, which is gonna be about a 20, 24 foot long slide uh, down the hill. These are very, um, uh, a number of uh, uh, parents and a number of uh, uh, our team have, have uh, uh, experienced these at different parks, and it'll be built into the hillside here. We're gonna use the topography to really help us. There's also a seating wall, as well as many benches, shade structures, we're adding shade structures. If you're familiar with um, the, the comfort station at Groff Park, there's a, a hardscaped area here that really has nothing there, and it never has. <laughs> it was designed to be activated. We're gonna activate that space with shade structures and seasonal tables and chairs. So parents can be here, they might be watching a softball game or an ultimate game or a football game over on these fields because of course this entire area is all fielded uh, section of Grove Park. There'll be a knee wall, a sitting wall all along this side of the park as well as benches here, 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 shade structures. This area is going to be designed kind of like a stream. One of the themes were we're, we're working with here is to kind of have it be as natural as possible. We want the colors to be, to be subtle. Uh, this is not gonna be a uh, primary colors, uh, kind of urban feel um, uh, uh, spray park. We heard that loud and clear uh, during some of the public sessions. Um, we're talking about features that are durable. We've gotten a lot of feedback from other communities, particularly on the spray park side of things, to pick features that are durable. Um, stones, artificial or real, that have uh, water spouts coming out of them. Try to minimize the number of really complex features because those break and have problems. And when they go down, a lot of the experience is lost. This area will actually have a, 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 a water feature in it where water will pool, but uh, not not deep, not deep enough to require lifeguarding, and then go down this stream. So kids will be able to kind of sit in the stream, play in the stream, dam up the stream with their bodies if they want, uh, do some real playing here. So it won't just be a hardscape uh, structure. Uh, all of this will be painted concrete. We're also looking, uh, of course, at the most sustainable uh, design, including a recycling, re recirculating system for water. There's either drain away or uh, recirculating. Uh, our, our team is firmly in the camp, of course, of using a recirculating system. It's higher cost uh, from the start, um, but then uh, you reduce the water costs over time, uh, over the season. So that's where we are with the spray park. Our goal is to be under construction mid-September. We have, uh, this will come before the Conservation Commission in the next four to five weeks. Uh, because some of the park is in the riverfront area, but we don't anticipate that being a major uh, hurdle for us. There'll be some uh, review by uh, the design review board. Again, we're not anticipating, uh, we'll be open to their, to their input, but we're not anticipating um, any uh, real roadblocks there. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, along your travels with this plan, if the, um, Disability Access Advisory Committee has seen it yet. And I know that this is gonna be accessible. I know there's a lot of sensitivity from members on that. Um, but in, and you haven't picked the structures and the play equipment yet, but um, it just sort of underscored for me more recently when I went to the town fair, walking around with my granddaughter, and there was a young boy in a wheelchair. And he got to be pushed around, but he could only look at everybody on every ride because there was wasn't one ride thank you that you could 
be in your, he had to be in his chair the whole time, that you could strap a chair on and participate. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, not only are we designing a park that will be accessible, but we are going to select both features of the playground as well as the spray park that can accommodate uh, young people with uh, disabilities with a wheelchair. Uh, and our team has been looking at different examples. There's actually swings um, that can accommodate a wheelchair um, and we will have uh, features in each of these that accommodate uh, those, those young people who, who may need that, uh, that kind of uh, uh, equipment. I would, so, I would jump in on that. At, yeah. at one of the uh, public sessions, a parent who had a child in a wheelchair was there and noted that some of the images that they had on their boards showed the wheelchair child watching and not participating. But there were other images where that child was in the in the splash park, and they, <laughs> and it was just a, an aha moment for the designer to say, "Why am I using an image that shows them watching and not Absolutely. participating?" And um, and the parent was like, "That's I want to see." you should be showing images of children participating, not watching from the outside. Mm -hmm. And it's an aha moment for the designer to hear a parent say just what you said was, we need participation, not observation. Thank you. So if I may follow up on that, you, you're showing a, a lower um, either renovation or, or rebuild of a, a, a pavilion down at the lower part. It's in the upper part of the drawing. Um, but that's, you know, so if you go down the long slide and you keep going, kind of following that along, yeah, right there. Yeah. Um, what's, the, what's the plan for accessibility to that? Because that's a pretty steep hill, which is great for the slide, but I just didn't know if there's any way to create a path or is there any concepts around walking paths that lead to that that sort of take a more gentle slope that can get you there or not? And it may not be really very possible at all, but I'm just sort of it's, curious. It was never envisioned in this project. Um, primarily because of budget. Uh, it would absolutely, to create a switchback path going all the way down there, we are putting in, of course, a upper pavilion that will be 100% accessible uh, to any users, but this is a very, very significant um, uh, uh, cost to, to actually do that. And in fact, uh, we, are, we are only able to do this because we're going to create a pavilion or replace the pavilion there on the exact pad. This is within 100 feet or less of the, of the Fort River. Right. So we are only going to be able to, to simply put a new pavilion there, and that's about it. Right. I think in the future, we could certainly look at that, but that is mm -hmm. a very significant budget number to get a path all the way down. You can see the topo lines here right. to those get are, all the way down feet, there. Right. Yeah. So what, what I was thinking is more of like if you had a walking loop that could take a longer trajectory around to sort of ease your way down without having to do like the switch back. I know it's, you know, it's 12 feet of run for every one foot of change in elevation. So if you have a 15 feet change, you've got to have 15 times 12. You know, that's a 100 something, 170 yeah, feet or whatever. My guess is. is you're north of hundred, two hundred thousand dollars to yeah. get something down there. And it's certainly something we could look at at the future to allow any users to get down and enjoy this lower level. With this phase, it was really all about this right. upper level. And also activating to make sure that everything here, restrooms, uh, shade structures here, pavilion here, all the equipment in the, um, in the playground and the spray park were all accessible. We will be grouping these as well uh, by age and we will be selecting them. And I'm, of course, I'm gonna leave this to people with more expertise than I do at Berkshire Design as well as uh, the, the folks from LSSC. So we'll be grouping both the equipment in the, in the playground and in the spray park for ages so that, you know, uh, and there'll be consideration of where the different components are both in the spray park and the playground because of course, there'll be interplay back and forth. Kids will be running back and forth. This will all be on one level. So you will likely have, uh, you know, they, they talk about five to eight year old uh, uh, users in, in one group and then nine through, you know, 10, 11 uh, in different groups. So um, that will all be accommodated for in the design is where those features go. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I do think it's critically important that DAAC itself see this in addition to, we, of course, we know everybody builds and Berkshire Design always builds to ADA, but they really need to see it for exactly the reason that you mentioned. And also what we have found in the past is when we worked really hard to redo Mill River, which now seems like forever ago, but made it much more accessible and it not literally been accessible before and then it was except in some ways it wasn't to a parent in a mobility device. So particularly as you talk about the age groupings, thinking about the fact that sometimes parents are able to parent their children from a mobility device and therefore want to be able you know, to not have them have to be way over there because the parent can't get closer. So, so taking that into not only the child is participating, but the parent is close enough that they feel like they can supervise their child from that distance. And I think that's where talking to the DAC is really useful because if you haven't lived that experience of parenting a child out of a mobility device, I think that makes a lot of difference for people. I appreciate that comment. We're now at the point in the design process where we have the concept, we know the layout, we can apply to the Conservation Commission for a notice of intent or a request for determination. We will be going to the DAAC, the DRB, and the planning board. The planning board is, is uh, we will see this as well. So those three mm -hmm. committees or boards will see this and we will get their feedback. So I appreciate that. Right, and just to follow up for everyone watching at home too, it's exciting that there's gonna be a second pavilion because that's what we haven't had before yes. at Groff. And so the fact that it used to be that you couldn't get there from there if you had any sort of, even if you had a, a cane, people could not necessarily take that slope to go down to the pavilion to celebrate whatever event they wanted to celebrate very easily. And so th the fact that there will be now a second pavilion up at the top, I think is very exciting for people. And men feels like, you know, okay, maybe I can't get down to the lower part and I can't get to the river, but at least I can do lots of things up here. I would presume that LSSC would have a similar reservation process or something like that. I'll leave that up to LSSC to, to uh, accommodate use of the upper pavilion. Just in terms of timeline, I want to give you just a quick, uh, so our, our goal here is to be under construction, you know, mid-September. We will get as much done on the site as possible before the snow flies, and we will be back at it in the spring. Our goal would be to have a ribbon cutting on or around this time in June 2019 to be open for the entire season. Uh, of course, this fall, we, we wanted to get in working with Mr. Bachelman. Um, uh, we wanted to make sure that people could use this area for the entire summer, which they will be able to do, and then it will be fenced in late summer, uh, but most, most, uh, most people won't even notice the disruption because all summer long they'll be able to use the, the restrooms and, and all the rest of the features of the existing playground. Right. So just to follow up on the notion of the existing comfort station that's there, um, memory serves, there's sort of one side of it that has a, uh, not a roll top, but, uh, you know, a, um, concessionary. A, concessionary. a concessionary. And so like, given that you're going to have people there on a regular basis, is that an idea, again, talking about sort of ways to generate some revenue to help maintain the, the facilities? Um, you know, obviously it's an area we haven't talked about parking and what we might charge for parking or that sort of thing, but certainly a concessionary, just the fact that you've got a large number of kids being very active and an you know, separate from the opportunity to potentially generate revenue that help offset costs, but just the idea of having something for people to eat because there's not food nearby, whereas, you know, um, you know, other areas that we have do have that as an option and there's really not any, you know, sort of food opportunities near Groff Park. Um, unless you bring your own, which is fine too. But but I was just curious if t those conversations have happened yet or at all, or what thoughts have, have happened around that? Um, it has certainly been brought up in some of our meetings. Uh, it was designed to have a concession there. Uh, I would leave those discussions, I'm sure Mr. Bachelman and I working with um, um, Bar Bills would, would uh, have those conversations. Um, I will say that at this point, there is a certain sport that requires helmets that takes up most of that space in that concession stand. Um, uh, so football is current. All the qu football equipment is currently stored in that in that space. Right. So um, we'd awesome. have to find another location. Right. Um, I don't know. So anyway, two things. Uh, maybe food trucks are the new concession stand. Yes. yes. And there may be an opportunity to, if, if it's financially feasible, to have concessions. There may be a way to. 
have that there. Um, just that I had been to one of the sessions at Crocker Farm School, it was really well attended. Um, and I want to appreciate you, Mr. Zemeck, and everyone who's been working on this that you've mentioned. Um, it's come a long way, and it wasn't that long ago that I was at that session, and I can see that a lot of the comments have been incorporated, and this has really evolved. Um, so I think, um, you know, sort of kudos to people who, who are um, spending time on this, because it's, it's come a long way. And I also really appreciate that people went to some of the apartment complexes near Groff Park. You know, it's sometimes hard to get um, people out for these, but it sounds like there was participation, and that um, enriches the whole process. So I'm really excited about seeing this hopefully next year for use. That's yeah. really great. Thank you. If I could just add, I, I neglected to mention that we will be, as part of this, restriping the parking lot, which this doesn't really reflect. We've had some very um, spirited discussions about how we deal with this odd-shaped parking lot, and, and I wouldn't, this don't hold hard and fast to this, this layout. The most important thing is how do we address people coming to the park with disabilities, how, do, how and where do they park, and then everything else will kind of pivot off of that. There's lots of spaces out there, but it is kind of a free-for-all. So uh, I know that talking with Mr. Mooring, we've talked about coming up with a, a new striping plan for the parking lot. As part of the free-for-all and referring to the lunch cart conversation earlier, I think it would be great if you were able to perhaps talk with Mr. Kravitz right now. We, have, we don't have anything really licensed, but in speaking with him and Mr. Mora in regards to, you know, the ranges of things that, that they tend to in take up, because we can, we can guarantee that ice cream trucks are going to show up anyway, yeah. and the ding-dong truck, or however we call it these days, and so Make planning for it in terms of, I mean, obviously the important stuff is the, is the handicap accessibility, but going ahead and planning for, if we wanted it to be somewhere, where would we want it to be, given the fields and given the other things, rather than saying, ah, shucks, I wish we'd thought of this before, so. I think that's a great comment, and I'm very much in favor of kind of looking to the private sector on that. I think we've designed some spaces, we sell some things at Mill River Pool, but mm -hmm. it's not something we often do extremely well. And, you know, I think having food trucks there be permitted to be there, yes, yes. Um, uh, both at Groff, Mill, other parks, is, is a direction we should look at. So mm -hmm. happy to do that. Uh, support Mr. Kravitz and, and Ms. Bills. So other questions before I move on? I think so. Go ahead. Um, so moving along to a project uh, that we are working on with uh, designers Weston and Sampson uh, out of Boston and Worcester. Um, this is, uh, you, you may recall, a project that the Recreation Working Group has been focused on for about the past year. And we're excited to bring forth uh, a couple of different concepts that we have been vetting publicly. We Again, we, we think we've done uh, uh, quite a good job at having public meetings where uh, 30 to 40 uh, people, I, I think we've had two in this room, um, and we'll have a couple of more before we're done. But the goal of the project uh, that the Rec Working Group got CPA funding for and then uh, matched that funding with school funding was to do a conceptual master plan for community field, the Amherst High School fields, and the middle school fields, as well as at least uh, incorporating wildwood fields, knowing full well that that site, you know, has been the focus of a number of studies, if you will, over the last couple of years. Um, but we're excited to have three different concepts, and I, I won't have the time tonight to go into great detail on these, but suffice it to say that we've gotten a lot of input. The uh, athletic director, the finance director for the schools, uh, Mr. Slaughter, I think, has been at every meeting. Um, we, we've had uh, student athletes at our meeting. We've had coaches, both private and, and uh, coaches in the public schools. And the goal is really to look at this area uh, for the public watching us at home, which is community field, which is town-owned land here, and then the high school fields here. And I think tonight I'll really just focus on those because we can get into sub-conversations about the uh, middle school and and Wildwood and, and um, uh, 
the other uh, piece of property we own over there, but I think the, the major focus here. And so again, Weston and Sampson uh, has come out. They've done a full assessment of all the fields. They've looked at the condition of the fields and facilities, the War Memorial Pool, the track. Uh, they've looked at ADA. They've looked at parking. They've looked at egress access. Um, and they've come up with three different designs, which I'll just quickly go through for you um, and highlight some of the major features. So uh, uh, option one, um, and again, I'm gonna be kind of brief here because we've had uh, hours and hours of meetings on this. Option one, uh, the major feature of this is that it realigns the track. The track is now currently aligned east-west. This proposes to realign the field north-south, which is a more accepted uh, alignment uh, in New England given um, sun. Uh, it, it, it prioritizes the track because as many of us know from being at many public meetings and town meeting, the track is in very poor condition um, and needs to be replaced. And our goal here is not to replace it on site in the east-west uh, configuration uh, and spend uh, probably north of half a million dollars on something that probably should go in a different direction. Uh, it moves the softball field, which is currently here closer to the high school, over to this corner, again in a more natural and more conducive uh, uh, layout uh, given the sun. And it creates a practice field adjacent to a main field in the middle of the track. Now, Weston and Sampson was, with all the input that they received, they were given a number of different uh, uh, directives. Look at ADA, look at the current condition of the, the resources and facilities we have, try to maximize playing field uh, uh, square footage. Um, of course, give equal billing to both uh, sports for men and women. Um, and if there are any uh, uh, inequities there to correct those, it was to really look at things like, a great example is even the baseball field here is currently not accessible. The softball field in its current location has no walkways. You're simply on grass, there are steep slopes, there's muddy areas. They looked at all of those. Um, so finally, uh, you'll notice that near the War Memorial Pool, uh, Weston and Sampson suggest a small spray park associated with the pool, as well as um, walking paths throughout the entire, uh, the entire configuration, both north of Mattoon Street and south, which would actually connect all the way over to the middle school. In other words, we could create, through those walking paths, an exercise trail for people to walk with strollers, to run, um, in addition to a new track. Now, I will say one of the assumptions that we gave to Weston and Sampson was that the DPW parks and, and uh, uh, park, trees and parks uh, building would be leaving. So they did program this space. They incorporated some exercise stations here in and among two new basketball courts, uh, the spray park and the War Memorial Pool. We also want them to, on the south side of War Memorial Pool, to incorporate a more significant War Memorial structure there. Um, as we all know, that War Memorial built in the 1950s is a flagpole, a small circle of flowers and a stone, but we think there's an opportunity to achieve something better and more lasting and more representative of the respect that we have for all of our veterans who served and, and, and died in, in various conflicts. So that is uh, concept one. Um, Concept two, uh, I won't go into great detail, but you can see if you, if you looked at this at all over the weekend, uh, it has the track, again, oriented north-south, uh, the track and in inside field, uh, but instead of close to the high school, they moved it over uh, to the uh, west. Um, all of these um, concepts assume that our goal is multi-purpose fields. What they identified is that we have designated space, for instance, the football field. The football field, to my knowledge, is uh, not used uh, for much else besides football throughout the year, yet it is using a significant uh, amount of square footage of turfed, natural turfed area. Um, this would propose, in both uh, scenario one and two, 
would propose to put the football field in the middle of the track and move it from its current location near the parking area at the high school. Um, so that's primarily uh, what we see. Uh, we had a, another, another practice field here associated with the main field. Um, and then finally in number three, which is a little more radical, um, this proposes to create the multi-purpose field, uh, which would accommodate football, ultimate, lacrosse, any of the uh, sports that require a larger field inside the track, and it would move uh, the Zomek field, if you will, over uh, closer to Triangle Street here with practice fields in the outfield and here and the softball field. So you'd really have a softball and baseball complex north of Mattoon Street. Um, each one of these proposals, by the way, takes advantage of the natural topography to create bleacher areas that can be built into hillsides. And as we know, there are hillsides here and here and here. So if we go back, we, we know that um, this area is very tight in here near the baseball field. And then, of course, um, there are currently bleachers at the, uh, at the toe of the slope here. But bleachers could be built into those slopes, taking advantage of that topography. So right now, I think, whoops, I will end there. Um, we have similar <laughs> concepts for the middle school um, with modest um, um, proposals for Wildwood School, given, given some of the questions uh, that, that we're exploring with our elementary schools. I think the, the hope here is that we can provide concepts and cost estimates that can inform future leaders, future finance committees, school committees, as to setting goals for the future. What are our short-term and long-term goals relative to our, our main central athletic facilities in town? We know that the track is going to be a driving force because it will not last many more seasons. At, at a point where it gets, um, I don't know if condemned is the right word, but if it is not approved to be used for track and field events, then we will have to come up with an alternative. So I think the goal here is to have Weston Sampson finish their work in July, present it to the town, present it to the school committee, and then uh, with it will come cost estimates and a phased approach that might be over the next 10 to 15 years. So I think I'll stop there. Right. I'll just add a couple of small things because I have been on the, the recreation working group. Um, one thing to point out is that the, the area around the War Memorial Pool, you'll notice there's slight differences between each of the three um, layouts. And in, and in some ways those can be, uh, I don't want to say plug and play, but you can, they're, they sort of hit the same amount of, uh, of square acreage. And, uh, and so um, if there are particular things that you like, like some of them have two basketball courts versus one, some put the pool house being rebuilt in its current location in another one. It has it sort of on one side of the facility, a little larger, so it might be a shared facility with the school and the pool, um, that sort of thing. So those can, can kind of mix and match, as it were, amongst the options that are here. So I just want to point that out uh, a little bit. Um, and there's some advantages and disadvantages in more detail that, that we talked about at the actual public meetings. Um, but we'll, we'll have an ongoing and continued spirited discussion about what's the best overall approach. But anyway, so do people have questions? You want to so, yeah, I think just to reinforce what Mr. Zomak said, which is we, the goal is to get an overall plan that we agree on, talk about an implementation plan, and then talk about the financing. I think what it's going to be a real sticker shock for people is how much all this is going to cost. It's um, millions of dollars. We're not talking about a few hundred thousand dollars. It's millions of dollars to do this, and that's why we won't be able to do it all at once, but we need to have a plan and an implementation schedule for how we can address it. Some things can't wait very long, like the track, which is a deplorable con condition. Um, and so once you say, okay, we're gonna put a lot of money into the track, then you wanna put it where you're gonna keep it. And that drive in the football field sort of drives a lot of the decisions about that, where the track is going to be. But we're talking about a lot of money that need to be addressed for the fields among a lot of other capital needs that we're facing, roads, DPW, fire, schools, all the et cetera, et cetera. 
Mr. Curry. I've spoken against incrementalism earlier. I um, actually want to reverse my position, and I think <laughs> doing it, why not? Um, in phases totally makes sense. And the, the one meeting I went to, it came up a little bit afterwards, um, conversation, and I understand they haven't done the cost estimate piece. But once the track is located and that sets the master plan for where everything else is going to go, you can do that as the first capital phase. There's a little bit of extra cost if you, as you keep moving things around until you get to phase two or three because you, you know, there's an economy in doing it all in one fell swoop, but probably not realistic. Um, it's really exciting to think about having a kind of sports complex area that both has some park-like features, the pool, public areas, and playing areas that are kind of at a standard where other schools are going to want to come here for tournaments, and we can host that. And you said that the track is just already unacceptable. So getting the master plan fixed so you know what that first increment is and then work around that over the number of years because some fields might be temporary until they go to their permanent and all, all of that sort of um, phasing and fitting the puzzle pieces together. But I think. Um, along with some other things we've looked at tonight, it is absolutely exciting to see us making progress on something that is so needed, and we all know how important sports are for overall development of youth and adults. I love the parking, the the pathway loop. Um, I, I spend my, some of my best exercises walking around with friends in different places. So to be able to do that and then drop back and watch a game or Mm -hmm. Watch little kids play. It's just great. Uh, and then the other one, other debate will be natural turf versus artificial turf, and the advantages and disadvantages of both. And that will be another major conversation that the community mm -hmm. will have because people feel very strongly no, on both but sides. One or the other. Yeah. yeah. I'm agnostic. One other thing I'll comment just to that point a little bit is um, one of the other requests the the working group has made relative to to Weston and Sampson is to give us some estimates of, um, I mean, there's, there are estimates of what uh, natural surface fields can tolerate, you know, how much usage can they, mm -hmm. can they take, and, mm -hmm. and some of the work that's been done by our own staff as far as accumulating the current uh, workloads on those fields was to get a sense of, of what our current use is and whether or not the fields can tolerate that. There's some rest that's necessary for, mm -hmm. for grass, and, and, um, and also um, is what are the, the maintenance costs. In other words, to maintain a, a natural surface field or an artificial field, there's a certain amount of maintenance that has to occur, um, both, you know, it, with a natural surface that's, you know, reseeding and, you know, perhaps watering, fertilizing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What are those costs and, you know, both labor and materials? And also the same thing with, with any artificial surface. There is maintenance and, and work that needs to be done on those kinds of things. What do those kind of numbers look like? So that not only are we planning for the capital project, but also we're being able to start to prepare our operating budgets to handle that workload to maintain this space and have it last for us uh, over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> thank you for putting that so nicely so I didn't have to put it quite as bluntly as I normally do, but I'll go ahead and do it bluntly anyway. We work really hard not to offend each other here at this meeting because everyone's working super hard. We have short shrifted our maintenance budget and our operating budgets for a very long time, decades upon decades. and. One of the reasons that the track is in such abominable condition is because we didn't figure out a way to program to do better with it, even though, of course, over time it would deteriorate some, et cetera. Um, and so I really appreciate that you keep bringing that up, Mr. Slaughter, because we really need to start doing that, and we haven't been doing it because we have so many competing needs that we've pushed maintenance off a little bit, and we just can't keep doing that. So. Well, we can, obviously, because we've done it. Um, what I'm trying to get across is I think that the values are such that we are trying hard to avoid continuing doing that, so thank you. And reminding people, of course, that artificial turf, for those who aren't in the world that you guys are in, um, is not just, oh, you lay it down and it's all done, and uh, it's a whole lot different than that. When they're continuing to do the little advantages and disadvantages chart, I realize they're already down to like four point type, but um, it would be incredibly helpful to me as someone who, let, let's be really clear, does not care at all about a type A or type B field because that's not where my head's at, um, but cares that coaches and kids have what they need. 
I would like those advantages and disadvantages areas to mention the change in the pool house and to mention the basketball court number. I mean, I know we can see them because they're nice and blue, but to mention that as part of the advantages and disadvantages in those cases, I think is really important. It's already talking about storage, and that's really important to some people, but that's not important to people who are walking around there using it. Um, and so going ahead and including some of those like user-friendly type statistics, I think is really helpful, particularly with the change in the pool house, just in terms of understanding what that would mean. And then along those lines, because so many people are familiar with every detail of how every field is currently laid out, but I will happily admit that I am not able to tell apart which kind of field is which kind of field, I think it's incredibly important to have a drawing like this in the packet as you continue to go around that shows what's there right now. Yes. And I know you have that, and I know you've used it in different places, but having it again here to remind us, wow, we'd have so much more stuff <laughs> is, is incredibly helpful, I think, to remind us of that, that that's why it costs so much money, because we're trying to meet a whole lot of different needs by doing this. But to show, again, what the current conditions are, I think, would be really valuable as this packet continues its way around the world. I, I appreciate that we have many of those images already. In fact, we have, um, we asked for that very definition of type A field, type B size, because it's very hard to tell them all apart. How big is an ultimate field, lacrosse? They all play on different size fields, so we have all of that. And what's exciting is in this report, all of that will be compiled for us. Uh, Mr. Slaughter and I didn't even talk about, in that report also will be usage data We've never had this in the time I've worked for the town. We've never known how many teams, how many individuals, how many games are played on this field, that field, or that field. Thanks to LSSC, planning, DPW, everybody's come together and gotten that data. It'll be included in this report um, for future planning. But it's it can be a little startling to see how many games mm -hmm. are on these fields. And Mr. Slaughter talked about resting. Um, for some of them, there isn't a lot of rest. So we will have all of that in that one report. The other thing I'll mention is that these images were actually at the, at the public meetings on two foot by three foot poster boards. So the, the advantages and disadvantages were a much more reasonable font size when they were blown up. <laughs> well, then you have room for more of them. That's right. So it was so Just to follow up on that, I, having been at one of the presentations, I, I appreciate your comment, Ms. Brewer, but this is almost like the thumbnail of the executive summary of what was <laughs> A full, a full evening and there was a lot of information. And another takeaway I, I got is about the, the field resting. Some of the fields are so wet so, so much of the year that while they you, you could see them in the aerial view, not, not, not just here but the other fields that we use like at Fort River, whatever, that it overtaxes the ones that are more usable when they're needed. So um, the distribution of use really varies on the weather conditions in a given season and so that's also stressing some of the I will say that Mr. Bockelman knows my enthusiasm for these projects, and he did give me some guidance as to how long I could speak right. on these. So I'm trying to keep it. We have many more slides, but I know you have a full agenda. It's all online for the spirit. Well, like I said, if there's a chart that has advantages and disadvantages, it could include the number of basketball courts no, in understand. the chart. Yes. I, no, I, I, it was, Although I, I realize there's a lot more words in the full report. <laughs> I didn't know there was a lot more pictures. And all of these projects are on the planning website and have much more extensive images and when the public meetings have been and even minutes and notes taken at um, uh, most of the public meetings. I will finish with a project that is probably, um, it's, it's uh, coming a little behind the other projects simply because we kicked it off um, just uh, a few weeks ago, but you all know the, um, the North Common and the Main Street parking lot. Um, we are using a combination of CPA funds and uh, transportation fund dollars to fund the design and uh, construction of improvements to both of these facilities. Um, we had the first public meeting. I was actually not able to go. I know Mr. Bockelman went and perhaps some of you were there as well. It was attended by 45 people or so. Um, we prior to that in, in previous years have had public meetings, so there's been quite a bit of lead up to this. It's kind of been a plane on the tarmac waiting to take off. Um, I will say that, you know, again, the goal now for those out in the public 
The goal now, uh, although we started looking at the design or redesign of the North Common, uh, we've now incorporated the design of this entire area between Spring, Spring Street, Boltwood, South Pleasant, and Main Street, including the parking lot directly out in front of the town hall, which is right there. This is a, a, just a concept that um, Paul Dethier put together uh, for one of the grants that we submitted. I just had it here because it was one of the few images. There's one more uh, showing uh, what uh, Paul Dethier, who's one of our uh, part of our engineering staff, put together. Um, so the focus here is to redesign and improve the North Common and redesign uh, uh, and improve the parking area out in front of the town hall, all as one project. We're looking, obviously, at things uh, broadly, ADA, um, the need for parking, the need for lighting, access to the common, across the common. We're looking at erosion issues on the common. We are acknowledging the common, the North Common, as part of the historic uh, uh, fabric of our downtown. Also acknowledging the fact that it is in such a central location here. It is really at the heart of our downtown. And how can we make improvements to make it more aesthetically pleasing, more functional? Could there be um, uh, sitting areas? Could there be plazas where people could gather? Could there be seasonal tables? All of these things have come up in the public uh, forums that we've had. Again, Weston and Sampson is working with us. It's a team of DPW planning. Uh, LSSE is at the table. Um, the Historical Commission uh, and LSSE are really t uh, commissions are taking the lead uh, uh, in this uh, as hosts of the public meetings. So all of that is being kind of fed to Weston and Sampson. Uh, again, we, we decided a few months back to take our time with this. It's so important that we will be taking the summer and part of the early fall to really come up with designs for the North Common and the parking area. We hope to bring those back to you in September, early October. The goal here would be to bid the, the, the project out in the winter to be under construction after the graduations at Amherst, Hampshire, and UMass in the spring of 19. We have about a million dollars. That's both for design and build. That's not a lot of money. Um, um, so we are going to have to do the very best with, with that budget. Uh, again, lighting, electrical, walkways, uh, how do we accommodate all of these things we'd like to see in the North Common and the, and the parking there? So I'll stop and... So I'll go ahead and be the difficult one. And um, not that I ever am on any other circumstance. So here are my notes, aren't they pretty? From the night of, the, of May 29th, and I appreciate that other bodies are still working on this, that this is not done and prepared for us at this point. We don't even put that in the packet because there's still a lot to go. I would, however, object to the media coverage that indicated that maybe Weston and Sampson should go ahead and take the parking lot away um, because so many people so many architects said that at that meeting that night. And while I totally appreciate what they were trying to get at and that heart of downtown concept came up so many times, I'd really like to rebrand it, that, um, that how dare we have parking in the heart of downtown. So, um, of course, my objection immediately was that this isn't Pulaski Park being redone, which didn't have parking to begin with and doesn't have parking now, but in fact is a huge parking lot down a switchback behind the front behind it. And that in the current climate, despite global climate change, it felt like we needed to keep that parking lot. So I'm hoping that Weston and Sampson has not been encouraged to remove the parking lot because that's gonna be a problem moving forward as far as I'm concerned if we try and do that. I do appreciate how frustrated people are that they wish we could do more with the site, but as you said, a million dollars is not really gonna get us a whole lot. We did talk definitely about the peace gathering, you know, up there in the corner to make sure that we took care of that, maybe improved its, you know, its levelness and, and the, the gathering space so that people could sit on a bench, you know, not have tripping hazards, et cetera, but that the rest of it given the amount of money that we have at this particular moment in time, is not going to be some huge, amazing, astonishing, uh, shiny thing in comparison to it's just going to work a lot better. 
because it sounds like we're, a lot of work is being put into the paths and the way the landscaping would work in terms of making the whole section flow better. So it will definitely be much better, but it's not like the kind of redesign we're doing out at Groff, for example. It's not that level of redesign. And as I said, I, I, I need to know now if you're planning to take out all the parking spaces because I have a problem with that. So um, parking is a concern. We are going to have fewer parking spaces no matter what because the parking is so narrow there. They're mm -hmm. going to be just when they just when they design parking spaces, they're wider because cars are wider now. Yep. So they're going to be fewer parking spaces. I think it's um, what people articulated at that meeting was that it was an opportunity to re envision what that whole north area that Mr. Zomek described could be looked at. I think everybody, you know, one of the senses was if we could do something that was different, but we preserved the majority of the parking spaces, let's look what, let's see what that looks like. I mean, I think the default is like for like, which is we just sort of improve everything a little bit from what we have. And that's might be the default thing that we have. But I think we want to, my goal would be to have options for the board to look at, to say, and here's another thing you could look at if you were looking more ambitiously about what could happen uh, for this. And I think that's sort of our duty to give you some options instead of um, saying this is um, just like for like as opposed to, and then you would also have an option saying, well, here's another creative, bold, brave um, concept and here's where the parking would then go to accommodate that exactly. we would have to do this to Boltwood Avenue in order to preserve the number of spaces that we want we don't want to lose parking is such a precious commodity here but I'll be honest you know at the we at the bid and the business improvement district um, uh, discussions that we when we talked about parking they were okay with losing parking in this area despite all their other arguments about parking they were looking at more, more eager for more um, hardscape areas at one point. That's true. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate options, bold options, visionary options, and I would hope that the um, downtown parking working group would be included as they have not been yet. So it's great to have a bunch of people get together for a charrette-like experience and kind of have some great ideas, but actually looking at what would be lost in parking. This is the most used lot in the town, in, in the downtown. And so we don't want to be at cross purposes with other goals. Um, it is a precious commodity and we could look at different options, but I think to be aware that some people have been working really diligently to try to make parking work better. And again, I think the idea of if you just reduce parking, people will ride their bikes more is not the way to think about this. Um, it's a, there may be a way to improve this greatly and lose five spaces and you trade that off and say, but we picked up three more over here and they're sort of looking at the net gain, net loss and some creative thinking. Creative thinking is always good, but I, I would be very reluctant to say because a bunch of people came and were excited about other ideas that that means we're gonna do it without a lot more public discussion about what it means to change the parking there and sort of backing up what Ms. Brewer said. Thank you, and if you wouldn't mind if I just followed on that. So while I appreciate that, you know, at least one member of the bid board said that, et cetera, and that's all well and good, but just watching as time goes by, as people need to use that lot for town hall, that's what they use for town hall, that's what they use for a lot of things. And so I would definitely, no matter, even with this, even with redoing the striping, because, you know, our parking spaces all over town are all different sizes. Um, <laughs> when we redo that, we should be evaluating the net loss, even if it's only three, to say where are those three going to be? And if then if we are doing angled parking on Boltwood or some amazingly creative idea like that, we need to really understand what those options are. But I appreciate that it would be brought to us as an option. What I'm trying to avoid is saying, oh, we everybody said it'll all work out. <laughs> That's not what I'm looking for as an alternative. <laughs> right. Mr. Zemeck. So I wish I had been at that that first meeting, <laughs> but I've been to other meetings um, on this on this topic. Um, clearly, we we understand parking is a major concern, and we we acknowledge that. Um, I will say it was the first public in this phase, if you will, uh, charrette on this. So I would look to Ms. Kruger uh, in terms of how we not at this meeting, but in a future discussion about how we liaison with the parking working group 
do we need to go to them? All of these meetings are open. They broad invites have gone out. Um, so I'd look to you to say, how do we liaison with them as we work through this? Clearly, Weston and Sampson is getting direction from staff through me. Um, so there's there's a balancing act, and they fully recognize that we are not going to lose you know all of those spaces, uh, and and we need to look at net numbers. So I think that um, could be arranged. Yeah, great. That was one of the things that I appreciated that Ms. Brestrup agreed to do actually at the meeting is I pointed out very direct directly that just saying everybody should come to the meeting is not going to be sufficient. And so you can't expect the Downtown Parking Working Group or the Historical Commission, which had almost none, if any, members present, um, et cetera, to show up because even some of them have been to the previous phases of this and know that they'll see it again. But Ms. Brestrup agreed that the names that were collected that night, that people would be notified not only of the next group meeting like that, but also as it went to the Historical Commission and as it went to the Leisure <laughs> Services Commission so people could show up at those meetings, mm -hmm. even though, of course, we encourage people to subscribe to meeting notices. But since those people had actually made the effort to show up and sign a sign-in sheet, not just to show that we had them here, but we can continue to notify them to please go to these other meetings because we cannot really expect that the Select Board, the Historical Commission, Leisure Services Commission will just be okay with what comes out of two big groups that happen to be at a certain night on a certain day. And so right. I, under I understand right. you know that, but I'm, we're telling the community, we understand that too, that people were out of town, but there are different places you can plug into this. And Ms. Brestrup mentioned there was gonna be a good bit more on the website as well. And, and just like the plans for Groff Park, we've actually taken those plans to two LSSE meetings Specifically, these will go to all of the various committees and boards. Um, I did also want to point out that there is a design team, not unlike Groff Park, there is a design team for this project that includes planning, DPW, um, LSSE, because they put in some of the funding for this uh, through CPA, uh, and of course the Historical Commission. That design team has been meeting with Weston and Sampson in the lead up to last week's meeting. So although the two Historical Commission reps couldn't be there at the public meeting, they have been around the table with us talking uh, about the project with Weston and Sampson, and that'll continue. So, so the, the point that Ms. Brestrup made, made was we can't have West, we've contracted with Weston and Sampson for a certain number of meetings. We're not going to have Weston and Sampson come to every committee meeting, but right. that's why our staff members are there to, to, right. go, to, be, to go between and engage with as many people as possible. And that's what we've yeah. done. As I said, at Groff Park, I was at the LSSC meeting last week with Nate Malloy, and we presented the Groff Park yeah, plans. Yeah. Right, it's yeah. fine. I mean, that's totally yeah. understood. Well, thank you very much for your input. I've taken yeah. some notes, and uh, we will come back with updates as, as they uh, are appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zubek. <clears throat> so next on our agenda, unless People need a break. I mean, break you know, a facility good. break would be, would be three advised. to five minutes. That would be All right. Why don't we take about a five-minute recess, and then we'll come back to it. Uh, next on our agenda is special and annual town meetings wrap-up discussion. I believe we have a memo in our packet. So, Mr. Buckland, do you want to take us through that a little bit? And sure. Start, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through that? Uh, so, in your packet is just uh, the sort of... Um, what I did last year, which is the all the items that we addressed at uh, the annual town meeting and what is to happen or what has already happened uh, so we can start to track that and keep you updated on where everything is going or what has to come forward. Um, the sort of substantive discussions will, are the three additional funding sources, uh, funding uh, requests, $60,000 for community services, $53,000 to the transportation fund, and $15,000 to the school, de school department. Um, and those will be things that we'll be working on and having a conversations with you about. Um, the rest of it is pretty, um, you know, uh, things that we just have to do, like the easements. When they're ready, they'll come before you. Um, there's some, um, the other stuff that the town clerk has done, she's uh, done, I think she's done pretty much all the things that she's supposed to do um, in terms of the, um, the resolutions in terms of the bylaw, the plain, the zoning bylaws, the planning board has to take action on, and then and then the clerk sends it in, in to the um, to the attorney general for re review, and um, so 
That's just an update for you. Yeah. Questions? Mr. Steinberg. Yeah, just real quickly on uh, back to the Article 9 additional funding things. I guess the only thing that I would um, hope the thought will be given to is if this, any of these would be the creation of new programs that would require multi-year funding to maintain them, that then consideration be given as to whether the transition provisions of the charter would indicate that before making a commitment to a new multi-year um, commitment to the town, whether we should be waiting for input from the new council. So, so maybe that's the first discussion on all, all each one of these things is to have that put that on the agenda for the board to start to have that. What does this mean? For, uh, is, a rec is it a recurring? Um, is it going to require additional uh, appropriation going forward or not? And maybe something that you would say, let, well, this should actually be left to the council to decide. To follow up, but when, when the uh, amendment came up for the 60,000 in community services, I, I gathered from what I heard from some town meeting members is they had an expectation last year when there was an additional appropriation that that meant it would be repeating and they were, uh, you know, projecting this of what I think people were saying, they were kind of surprised or shocked that it hadn't just been added as more community service funding and I'd never understood that prior extra appropriation as that. So I think we need to be really clear how we understand um, that that vote and it is subject to our own interpretation. But um, I think there was um, different expectations for sure about the year prior when money was added to community services and whatever we do decide to just be, make a clear statement about that. Yeah, I think it is about managing expectations, and we did have we did have a dedicated uh, time during a meeting where we talked about community services funding. We got very little um, turnout for that, except from individual agencies who were hoping for additional funding, which was not really what we were looking for so much as a conversation with the community because we knew we'd be facing this discussion. I also am fairly confident that if we'd added in 60,000, there still would have been an additional 40,000 projected, you Quite know, possibly. suggested by someone at that point, and maybe it wouldn't have been added and maybe it wouldn't have, but there's an underlying values question here that we tried to address at that special section of our meeting in the fall that perhaps didn't really have the effect that we were looking for. Um, and obviously the reason we didn't just throw it in there is because that's not how we do our budget process. We have all the various iterations over time as to how much money we can put into things. And certainly I am confident that staff did consider that and wondered, hmm, I wonder if I'll be able to do that. And then saw what our budget looked like and realized there was no way that that was considered the appropriate thing. Now, of course, there are town meeting members who think given the amount of money that we have, quote, left over at the end of the year, that of course we can accommodate that. But that is a different budget philosophy perhaps than what we have been following so I and I want to just compliment the town manager again for doing this because this is not something that ever existed in the public venue uh, in previous years and previous town managers so thank you because it's really great to be reminded of oh right there were all these things that we said we were going to follow up and do and we know we know that things like of course the town clerk sent things where she needed to send them we don't have that problem like some other communities that never sent their bylaw changes in to uh, we know that that didn't happen but still to have it all here in front of us and to be clear on you know, to be scheduled as what? I mean, one of the things, not I'm not trying to nitpick, but they are slightly different kinds of things. Like amending the zoning map is just something to go into the long parking lot, so to speak, of things that the planning board's gonna look at because that's not something that's necessarily of immediate, you know, in terms of the planning board's other priorities. Whereas the easements, as we get them ready, we're going to get them done. You know, we're not putting those off for months. And so understanding better the, the categorization of things, I think, um, as Mr. Steinberg pointed out, which things are just things we get over with, like, you know, Kingman Road easement, but, and others which are longer term discussions would be really valuable. But thank you for this chart. It's really helpful. 
not anything else on that, then we'll move on to charge transition update. This is the next item on the agenda. Yes. And it's already late, and so I just want to be clear. When we normally have a discussion about annual town meeting, since this never existed before, <laughs> as town manager, we also talked about town meeting in general and improvements and communication, et cetera. Were we planning, we don't have to do it now, we don't have to do it tonight, but were we planning to do that at some point? Because we do normally try and do that. And if we want to you know, just do it later tonight, depending on how late it gets, that'd be fine with me. But I'm just trying to understand what our plan was. Okay. Mr. Steinberg? I guess I would have to say, since the voters have uh, passed a new charter and this was the last annual town meeting, that uh, this that may not be a good use of our time. Might be true, but we should at least see if we have things that came out of that to discuss, such as what we just did with the community services. So it's our chance, and it. Um, I, I understood wrap up discussion to be anything that we thought was valuable um, coming out of town meeting. Obviously, some of the process things are moot, um, I think. But there may be other observations or lingering confusions or questions. Right. And would I, be a I, chance to talk I, about that. Forgive me for sort of wanting to move ahead there, but I'm certainly happy to have that conversation mm -hmm. now if we want to, or, or we can have it later this evening after some other things on our, so I'm open That's to either way. That's what I'd recommend, is we, that we go ahead and get other stuff done and then see okay. if we have time tonight. All right, that's perfectly just, fine with me. The further we get date-wise from when the events happen, it just gets harder, yeah. The foggier yeah. it becomes, that's all. Okay. So I think next, and, and this is an ongoing sort of agenda item, which will be there probably throughout the rest of our agendas, is the charter transition update and whether there's any additional sort of information relative to that. And so did you want to? So, yes, um, last Wednesday, there was a public hearing at the, in, uh, in front of the Joint Committee on Election Law at the State House on the action that was uh, incorporated into the charter and then voted and approved by the town meeting. And Mr. Steinberg did, led the testimony for the town. He should, maybe he wants to update on that. I, uh, I think you, your, your memorandum, uh, which included the testimony of the uh, people who presented at our request, um, except for uh, town council, um, who were really responding to questions and, co um, and comments of other um, witnesses, really pretty much speaks for itself. Um, the committee, uh, I believe understood the request um, and has it under advisement and um, we uh, hopefully we'll be hearing soon and uh, hopefully we will be hearing a recommendation um, for our bill favorably recommending it to the House and Senate and we will be able to get it moved in an expeditious fashion um, so that it can be enacted before the end of the legislative session. I, I do want to mention that there were res residents from the town of Amherst who testified against it. Um, and um, the senator and the vice chair from the House side had some pointed questions for their, con their addressing their concerns. Um, so I think um, we don't know what they will decide, but they will decide at some point. I think they understand certainly the that the the we were presenting the vision from that the um, options that were delivered that were voted on by the peop by the people at the elector at the ballot box and by the town meeting. Um, one member, the vice chair, said we're supposed to carry out the wishes of the town meeting of the town, aren't we? And uh, ac according to the law, because it's a home rule, and that was sort of his sort of summary of the process. Um, so it's it uh, really compelling testimony, and um, and so I think that that will, and I think they do understand the um, need for speed in essence on this. Thank um, Mr. Bockelman and Mr. Steinberg and um, the other members of the. Um, town team who went to the joint hearing. It sounds like it was 
you folks, and I know from the written materials, really prepared well and did an excellent job um, representing the town's point of view that the election dates should follow the state dates of uh, September 4th for the primary and November 6th, I believe, for the general. Um, I, I feel very strongly that that's the preferred action and that um, we're carrying out the will of the town. So certainly citizens have the right to go and speak at a hearing, um, but I am very um, much looking forward to he hearing that the town has prevailed in this issue and my we find out soon, but thank you for doing that. It was actually a lot of extra work. Yes. So, uh, and, and other items under the charter transition. Um, one is there's a memo uh, from the town attorney uh, titled Relationship Between Petition for Special Town Meeting and Charter, which addresses, gives you some guidelines if a special <coughs> town meeting petition is delivered to you. In essence, what it says is that um, the charter has the power of state law, and when state law uh, has, and this is more specific to the town, so any state law that's in conflict, uh, this will prevail over the state law. And I think that was one of the questions you were struggling with. If, if you were presented with a petition to call a special town meeting, how would you handle it? And I think this is a pretty comprehensive uh, opinion from the town attorney that addresses that. Um, and then the second item, was um, a interpretation of what it of um, what would happen, and it's another um, email opinion from town count from the town attorney. Um, if someone were to take out papers for two different positions, i.e., the councilor at large and the district councilor, um, what would happen if that person ha can that person run for both seats? And the answer is that the person can't run for two seats. Uh, the person has to choose one or the other and provided some guidance to the town clerk as the town clerk interacted um, with the candidates as they're um, taking out their papers and returning their papers. So I have a follow-up question on that since I had um, <clears throat> asked that we get that in addition to the clerk asking, I had asked that we get that in some level of detail because I knew that some people might wish to turn in two sets of papers and see if they got enough signatures on both to help influence their decision as to which one to vote for because obviously when you're running for district, you can only take signatures from your district and maybe that's the place as people learn how this works that you get more additional signatures because you have a much smaller pool of people that you're choosing from. Um, because I think it's important that we understand and that the community understand this advice from the standpoint that it has been my understanding up until this point that based on what uh, KP Law has said, that we are not going to be in the position of refusing to issue two sets of papers. We are not going to be in the position of refusing to accept two sets of papers, but what we are going to say is do this at your own risk <laughs> if you do that, because you do end up in a situation where if you don't withdraw one of the sets of certified signatures, you won't be on the ballot for anything. And so I think it's important that people understand that it's not that the town clerk is making a decision for them, it's that they're having to give them all this advice so that they understand that it's up to them to get it right and that the town clerk can't help you if you don't follow all the rules and so if you don't get it in by the deadline in terms of the certified withdrawal you won't be on the ballot at all so if it's not clear enough maybe you don't want to do that even though legally you can because you are taking a risk on messing up at some point in the process but i think it was really helpful to have all of that clarified in terms of all those levels of details because some people had worried that maybe they shouldn't be allowed to pull both sets of papers even to begin with and so clarifying all that i think was really important and it's just something we've not had to deal with before because one did not pull two sets of papers, say for example, for two different town meeting seats, like a one-year seat and a three-year seat, because you only needed one signature, so it was a very different circumstance. So thank you for getting all that from KP Law. So was there any, anything else? I don't think there was either. 
as far as the transition. Um, so the next item on the agenda, the town manager performance evaluation goal setting review timeline. Um, I think really the purpose of having this on here for myself, um, you know, there's wishful thinking on what I would do relative to last year's timeline of things and having that updated for tonight, which it didn't happen, but the piece that it, it serves uh, for us is that um, if you know your summer plans of when you will not be available, if those are coming together for you, if you would be so kind as to share those with me so that I might uh, shape our, our planning for our performance evaluation. And we do, we will need to have a little bit more conversation about that evaluation because I think, you know, given the transition, it, it is going to be a slightly different process we go through uh, as far as not necessarily that we'll not evaluate the goals that we set for the manager, but, but how we uh, uh, frame our responses may be a little different given that the select board is going away and a council is coming in and so it may change how we want to do it. It may not, but we have the conversation. But I think the two real key points is it's coming and, and if you could share with me any known um, uh, vacation or other plans that prevent you from attending any currently scheduled meetings. Um, I know mine are starting to come together for the summer, but not fully in place. Um, but it may require us, if I get feedback from people, we may want to change some dates or we may want to um, sort of shape our timeline relative to when people can be in town or are in town, so. I just suggest maybe you send us follow up to tonight. I mean, it's our responsibility, but like a reminder, like, hey, send me your dates by next okay. whatever. And then we see that email and we're like, oh yeah, and you know, going through and then send you what we do know so far. Right. Um, I think we're all probably not totally settled on what we're doing, but we know some of it. But if you wouldn't mind in a couple of days or soon doing that electronically so it's something like we can reply back to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. I think a couple of meetings ago at a pre-town meeting session, we did get last time's calendar um, in terms of how the process worked. And so if we are sticking with the same process, which obviously we haven't discussed yet, as you just indicated, but you know, on the one hand, maybe not bothering to change now <laughs> might also <laughs> not be a bad idea, is those dates are coming right up in terms of if we, if, and I think we're, we're in a different position now than if we knew this was a continuing process. Right. I think we might argue more about, uh, discuss amongst ourselves in a very helpful way about how we might ask for staff input because we've struggled with some with the forms and the format et cetera of those in the past but if we're going to just go ahead and say hey one last time we'll do it the same way it's fairly quickly that that starts happening and then is over and those deadlines are usually in the beginning of july for staff to get that information back so if anybody has a big thought about changing it now, I think you should express that to Mr. Slaughter now rather than two weeks from now because that, 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 that's going to just start having to roll out. Right. So it's, in, it's entirely likely given that we're meeting, if memory serves, and actually as uh -huh. our sheet says, we uh -huh. meet next week and then it's two weeks. So we meet the 11th and then the 25th. And certainly what I would like to do is at our meeting on the 11th have this topic again, but also have handouts in advance of that with dates and times and and again, probably mimicking what we did last time, and we can also, in, in the meantime, people can certainly feed back to me if they want or just save it for, for Monday's discussion. Um, if we think we should do our feedback from staff differently or not, or those sort of things. And could we include with that the goals again? Yes. So we don't have to, you know, read some of the materials. Um, I think we still have this couple here for this week and three days, three right. days, but just whatever we, this is going to, this is going to fall, <laughs> going to fall to the transition in that position as we right. get going. So whatever, right. I mean, I think we can probably find most of this, but just, it would help me to look at what Absolutely. we are, the, the evaluation tool and the goals. Yep. Those are the two, you may remember more in the schedule, of course. Basically those three pieces, because of course, at least two of them are readily available on the website, yeah, but right. we don't really get paid enough to have that many printer ink cartridges. So, <laughs> right. yeah, um, they're yeah. lengthy. It's nice to have like a kit of all the things. Yes. Right. And start putting that in its own folder. Right, exactly. So thank you for the reminders of, of some of that, but also um, it's helpful to me as far as mm -hmm. getting myself organized this week in preparation for 
both agenda review, uh, agenda setting, and, and right. um, just my own sort of work to prepare some materials. You really guide us in that review process. So if in, is there anything, any, any other topics about the evaluation and goal? Well, goal setting may be a very different conversation yeah, this year. But, but nonetheless, um, I think anything else on that agenda item, if not, we'll, we'll move ahead. Goal, so get us through this transition. <laughs> that's, that, will, <laughs> that will be the goal, that's right. Well, I think, that, I think that one of the things that would be, that we might actually almost want to spend in some ways more time on as we're going through and doing our individual evaluations is be thinking about, we often have a bunch of stuff we write at the end in kind of the open space, is be thinking about what are our recommendations to the future council right. as to, you know, we did this the, if we decide to just do it the same way again, which it's an awesome process. Come on, it has its limitations, but it's a good process we've developed over the years. That it has its limitations, and these are we went ahead and did it the same way because it was just going to so save time to do right. that. But we would really recommend you look at this, 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 and this as being things that you know, rather than just trying to exactly copy what we were doing, even as amazing as we think it is, uh, we know that we have challenges with it. And that way they can start thinking about it. Like, we can include that somehow in our evaluation right. as, a, you know, notes to our future selves right. kind of thing, that, uh, that then they can be thinking about that from the beginning. Right. As opposed to, oh, right, we have to go ahead and evaluate that person. Right. But right. they're not going to yeah. think about it till to right. Right. Well, that's the thing. Is, Human is, nature. You know, I've, I've certainly thought about that as well as what, what is the advice we want to give mm. the council as far as this. Because the other piece that we do, you know, we composite five um, evaluations into a single one. It's how do they do that with 13 people? That's a much different uh, animal than, than five. And I, having done the five one before, <laughs> more than twice as many is, is a daunting task to say the least. And so is there a, you know, I think we should all sort of think about is there advice we can give them about how to go about that process and, and yet still be true to, you know, open meeting law. We saw things recently, I think, that you may have shared with us, Ms. Brewer, regarding some communities that were not really doing their evaluation quite in alignment with, with open meeting law. And, and so we want to, you know, be, um, you know, careful to advise them about that as well so that they, they don't, you know, drop into any pitfalls that, that, that most likely unintentional, but nonetheless can be problematic. Screw. It makes me think, um, when we're doing the evaluation, I think it's certainly helpful, as Ms. Brewer suggests, to make some notes about you know, advice we might want to give. But maybe when we spend more time than that in one of our regular sessions, or maybe a separate session, where we work on a letter from this board to the future council that's a little more generic of it. Here's some things we've struggled with. You may want to, this is what we think you might want to think about, or, you know, it'll be sort of that movie about Schmidt, and we'll wrap it all in a nice package and give it to them, and they'll, like, <laughs> put it over here and never look at it again. But I think we might want to develop that idea into something where, that we actually have a document broader than just the manager evaluation that's our letter to the future council. We're talking about chapter one. <laughs> Seriously, because it's going to take more than one meeting to do that. And I think that it makes more sense for us to try and consider doing it on kind of a piece part basis. Like, okay, right now we're talking about evaluations. Well, yeah. having that awareness is, in doing Let's that, make yes. sure we make some notes. And right. so even if it never turns into this amazingly beautifully documented thing, but it's one set right. section A and another <laughs> section okay. is about project management or whatever. Um, but I think it's it, if we try and just save it up for a whole working session, I think we're going to be slamming our heads. I'm not on disagreeing. It. Just but you, you're right. Every, we need to think about everything in light of the conversation. So what I'm hearing, just to, since we've wandered into this path a little bit, is a topic for our future agendas. As much as we talk about charter transition, up you know, update, maybe a part of that is this sort of compilation of of ideas and and advice um, so I'm, I may see if we can f f more explicitly put that onto our agenda in the future um, I'll make a note of that now because of course we want more work to do and so if people want to 
offer a suggestion about how that could be in our agenda on a regular basis and how we might approach just even having good conversations and get things recorded. I'll take that advice for sure. I did a, just one quick question. Do you know if Mr. Wald is, when Mr. Wald is coming back? Because he's vice chair for June. I know. I do. <laughs> Perfect. That was well played on his uh, part. He, yeah. He's away until June 26th, then he's he's back on June 26th, then away July 5th to 14th. So maybe we should. I was wondering about um, Ms. Brewer is the next vice chair. If she and Mr. Uh, you, you should just take this under advisement, not decide this now, whether. <laughs> You should approach Ms. Brewer, Mr. Wald, about flipping some dates so that um, right. you have a vice chair and the benefit of Ms. Brewer's experience with uh, organizing the evaluation process. Right. That actually crossed my mind this evening when we, before the meeting, we discussed when Mr. Wald was being back. I didn't realize he was going to be gone quite so much of June as he is. But anyway, we will. Uh, I will take that under advisement. So thank you for that. Yeah. And so. Um, so I think we'll go to our next um, agenda item, unless there's something else we want to bring up on the last one there. And that is uh, in Section 5, Committee Board Appointments and Reappointments. Um, the main thing is an announcement. We, our bylaw review committee, as um, stipulated by the charter, um, is a three-member um, committee, and we've had a resignation of one of those members, and so we will need to find a replacement for that person fairly soon, because I think their ability to participate is perhaps um, been exhausted. So I think they're actually going to be um, one person short in the short term. So uh, we will need to get ourselves uh, a new person to serve in that role unless someone had someone offhand. Oh, I've already had two people turn me down. Um, <laughs> three, actually. But the if we could send us this, this, this is, is this now in our packet, this one? Because we, it's not on the page, and the page is really good. The, it's on the, page. Uh, the charge, it's, it's been added since I asked, because it's the not. The day you asked, it was added. Mm, well, well, no one told me. The, the text was on the page, and then the document right. was actually added. To no the page. one told me it got added, so that's I great. You because you like every hour. Yeah, I look every hour to see if people follow up on the things I ask about. Sure, that would be a productive use of my time. And so thank you, because I have been sending people there to read. I mean, there are already minutes there. They've been doing such a fabulous job right. of keeping that together. Mr. Kravis has been an amazing support to them. So um, thank you, because that really helps people understand what they're signing up for, in addition right. to referring to, to talk to Ms. Moran in between packing boxes that she's right. doing. Exactly. Can I just add for people who are watching and don't know what we're talking about? So one of the people on the on the committee had warned us when they accepted the appointment that they were on the brink of a life change that involved moving and that they would serve as long as they could and that uh, came about sooner than they might have thought. They didn't know when it would happen. So it's not that, um, you know, they left because they couldn't stand the committee. Right, yeah. <laughs> they warned, right. it was no, wonderful. On the committee. warned us wonderful. and accepted it with the caveat and then all happened really quickly and so we appreciate her her willingness to try to serve and it just didn't work out absolutely yeah there's there is no drama on the committee thank you that's an <laughs> it is excellent actually probably a very point. good group of folks to work with and so because yes. I, I went to uh their last meeting on the 29th and uh, observed how they work and what they're working on and and they're really it's a it is a it's a good group of folks and, and uh, it, you know there's a significant task ahead of them and they're they're approaching it in a very thoughtful and, um, uh, and precise way in a lot of ways and so they they do need that additional person to really help the share the workload so we will keep this on the agenda until appointed you, you can decide that tomorrow right I think we'll decide but yeah would, yes please probably be safest in that way we wouldn't right. forget to put we'll it on at some right. point if somebody turns up at the last minute absolutely all right so I think that <coughs> is through most of that stuff do we want to um, take care of the licenses on our agenda right now or do we want to get back to our discussion of, of uh, town meeting or do we want to get into other I'm open to suggestion from the board so I, I would lean toward sort of taking care of the licenses and okay. working our way through those Okay. I'm going to uh, make the motion on 7 double I because there's a slight change to the 
wording of the motion on the motion sheet with the removal of a word of the date Sunday in the third line. But I will move to approve the application of the kind grind incorporated doing business as shared coffee roasters for a common victuallers license to operate on the premises of 178 North Pleasant Street Monday through Sunday 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Marissa Smith manager is there a second second thank you for catching right. that. is there is there further discussion hearing none all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. opposed that's unanimous with one absent Please continue. I move to approve the application of Envision America LLC doing business as Shiru Cafe for a common vitrolers license to operate on the premises of 17 Kellogg Avenue, Monday to Sunday, 8.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. Yusuke Kakamoto, manager. Is there a second? Second. To further discussion. As much as I'd love to just treat this all as consent calendar, I think it's only fair that we let the community know that this is an unusual business model and they can go and check it out when it actually opens. But this, of course, is in the former, just as Cher is moving over to what was Shea Albert, this is the current Cher space that's becoming the Shiru Cafe. And because we don't have anything else quite like it in town in terms of coffee is free for students who have signed into an app, basically and provided information. And so it will be a really interesting way of potentially drawing more college students into downtown specifically for that. But people should not be surprised when they walk in and it's not just another coffee shop. And uh, th they can find out more about how it works when it opens. And actually, I think thanks to you, it was um, an article that's in the um, packet for this meeting. Yes. yes. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Unanimous with one absent as well. I uh, move to approve the request for reservation of two metered parking spaces immediately in front of the Greenfield Savings Bank branch at 108 North Pleasant Street on July 5, 2018, to park Eric Carl's signature Volkswagen Bug for the Art Night Plus event featuring Eric Carl's artwork. Kim Ali, Business Development Specialist. Is there a second? Is there further discussion? Yes. So is this in the category of they pay us for the use of the space or not? I was Sometimes we have a fee attached to these motions and there's not one here. So um, rather than having to decide each one, I wonder what the rule is and I think this, I'm guessing this does not because the next one, it, it cites the fee. So I'm guessing this is not Based one. on what, what criteria, yeah. that's what I we're wondering. So I, well, I, I think it's because it's part of Arts Night, which well, means the, it, I'm not saying that's the right reason, but I'm just saying I think that may be it, but I'm not, we have time if we want to defer this, so we can. I'm not saying whether that's a good or bad thing. I just, right. um, it's pretty fuzzy to me. Yeah, actually. Wouldn't, why the bank wouldn't pay to have this? Because they're making the request and it's a display at their place. Um, Go ahead. I for, I'm sorry, and maybe Mr. Steinberg is finding it. Does it say the hours? That's what here? I was looking for, actually. If it did, oh, yeah, the date to bag the meter is on July 5th from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. I think they're paying for it. I, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't, be, why they the, wouldn't, and so the I think we should consider our motion should indicate that they should pay for it, and if they have a problem with that, then just we can revisit it. Like ten dollars, but a space, it would only be ten dollars, and it's only one space. Uh, I just don't spaces. understand. It's two spaces. Right, two spaces. two spaces. I don't. I I just don't. While I I am obviously understanding the difference between a dumpster and a nice Eric Carl <laughs> Volkswagen Bug, I. I just don't understand the justification of taking central parking away during an event where people come downtown. So um, I would think that that would be something we would charge for. So I guess the question is, do we want to um, not take action on it tonight and take action on it next week and get that clarified? Or do we want to take action on it inclusive of the fee 
that's what you should do. That would yeah. be my mm -hmm. assumption, and then if there's a problem, it comes Yeah, to okay. So, so let's add to it $10 per day per meter for a total of $20. Yeah, just like and, it did. And uh, then it can, uh, okay. Ms. Pupple can discuss yeah. it with The her. seconder accepts that amendment. Is there further discussion? Uh, hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, yes. I'm sorry, we should have also corrected it to say from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. because the subsequent one does, I think there was just, it was just left out. I'm saying the hours aren't yeah. listed right. and they should be because should be. we know what they are. Yeah. And should so be consistent just with the one squeeze above. that in there someplace, okay. 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. as part of the motion, assuming the mover and seconder agree. Yes. Surely I do. Okay. Thank you. I move to approve the request of Ramble for reservation of four metered parking spaces on the west side of the Amity Street lot adjacent to the Bank of America parking lot on Friday, June 8, 2018 from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. for the delivery and removal of office furniture. $10 per day per meter for a total of $40. Cynthia Lemaire, Executive Assistant. Second. And yeah, there's a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 That's unanimous. So do you want to go on to the consent calendar questions? Yes, please. Um, so what I was, what I wrote for E, I wanted to go back to that first, and then I'm going to, uh, because everything else will get moved as a consent calendar as a single item, but we've already dealt with this before. I would suggest something along these lines, move to approve the reservation of metered parking spaces bordering the town common for um, artisan unloading and uh, cleanup for the Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Crafts on the Common Event, 13 on the east side of South Pleasant Street and 21 on the west side of Boltwood Avenue beginning at College Street and progressing north to the intersection of Spring Street beginning at 9 a.m. on Friday, June 22. Yeah, it's supposed to be p.m. Uh, 9 p.m. Yeah, right. 9 p.m. on Friday, June 22, 2018, and then period. And, mm -hmm. and by the way, Mr. Bachman, I will send this to you if it's adopted. So you, um, uh, the first five, and then the next sentence: the first five metered parking spaces on South Pleasant Street, beginning at the intersection of Spring Street, moving south, to remain reserved until 7 a.m. on Saturday, June 23, 2018. The remaining um, reserved until 9 a.m. on Saturday, June 23, 2018. And again on Saturday, June 23, 2018 from 3.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. period. So I think that, the, that all the spaces, uh, including the, the five, I believe, that are being released at 7 a.m., but those five plus the others are all being reserved on the afternoon of, mm -hmm. for, from 3.30 to 6.30. Correct. Okay. So just, uh, we could actually put that in. Um, and all spaces. Right. It just gets more and more complicated. <laughs> we'll just be but it, it'll come out all right. Yeah. Right. So it'll be so. Um, so the ending will be and all spaces on Saturday, June 23, 2018, from 3.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. So I'll take that as a motion to amend the original motion. Was there a second on that? Second. Statement? All right. Is there any further discussion on that amendment? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And so that would be an amended motion for that to supplant the other. We're, we're the, actually doing some work for the future council because next year, right. 
for the better structure. And um, then I move to approve the items listed on the consent calendar for June 4, 2018 agenda as presented except for Part E. Second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> Okay, so that's taken care of. Oh, yeah. I just have a quick Yes, please. I, I meant to bring this up way back on the first page when we were back with Ramble, who I pronounced, mispronounced their name, for the uh, four metered parking spaces in the what the cinema often thinks of as its lot or the library often thinks of as its lot. Um, if we could please, and I realize staff time is at a premium right now, but if we could please advise both the library and the cinema that we know that that's there <laughs> so that right. and, and it's during the day and so mm -hmm. hopefully won't have a huge impact on either one of those facilities <coughs> but just so that if they get complaints that they know that we did it on purpose but sometimes people just have to move and put the dumpster also, it's important for them to know it was authorized. The next yes. somebody just does it with a with a couple of cones and decides. Because we have seen that happen. Yes, that is a good point. Okay. So now heading back into our agenda, um, I guess we'll take up our our um, conversation about the annual town meeting and wrap up in discussion um, and so I think if if we would like to discuss some of the topics that are a result of town meeting and its outcomes um, I'm gonna pull back my memo on that but who would like to go first <laughs> Well, I appreciate what Mr. Steinberg said. You know, why why talk about it? It's possibly quite quite likely the last one. Um, it's a select board meeting, but I think it's okay to say I, f I found it very a very difficult meeting. Um, I think there were a lot of subtexts going around, and um, I feel good about the work that this board put in as a board and as individual members. As usual, a lot of preparation and thoughtfulness about getting ready. Every um, night before town meeting, we had an hour-long meeting and pretty much used all of that a lot in preparation for town meeting. And um, you know, I found the budget amendments um, very, very difficult, and um, I found the, the tenor of the meeting difficult. I think we dealt with it in a professional and, and even manner, but I, I just want to acknowledge that it was hard. I think it was hard for town meeting members for all kinds of different reasons. Um, but I think, we, you know, also the staff and Mr. Bachelman, um it took a lot of work to prepare. And um, I just want to acknowledge, I think it was a hard one. And I feel good about the work that we did. And a lot of um, things that we care about were approved including the budget and the capital budget and some important zoning happened and um, even though it's not necessarily something to pass on like a way to improve something and make it more efficient I just, um, we it's okay to spare a minute to just talk about what our experience was and I would just like to incur re regarding the, the hard work I think especially of staff it was it was you know uh, we were all sort of operating in a, in a bit of a unknown state as it Charted were about waters. how how to deal with certain topics and certain issues and, and a lot of fluidity to to the meeting and the potential motions and that sort of thing and i know that mr bachman and staff town council all had to do you know they, they always do a lot of work around town meeting but i think especially so this time and so that's greatly appreciated by us okay. and so i want to convey that to you as well as to the staff and town council mm -hmm. the, that 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 work was appreciated mm -hmm. and we understand how uh, difficult it was for everybody and and I think you're right. I think it's you know it was difficult for town meeting members. It was difficult for us as participants of finance committee, school committee. I think everybody had a lot of struggle in a lot of ways because there were a lot of questions and a lot of um, 
you know, unknowns. And so it was a, a, a tricky meeting in a lot of ways. And, and uh, but I do think we, you know, got to reason a lot comes by and large. And, and, you know, again, you know, kudos to you and staff and, and council on, on helping us through that. I mean, not just the, to, to let, not just appreciated, but th that it was noticed, even though we're, we're sitting up there with our straight faces on, but it doesn't mean we're not aware of, of the amount of work and, that, and their presence there. Mm -hmm. Right. So were there other? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, she's <laughs> just getting started. So one of the other things I wanted to follow up along those lines and again all of our appreciation to staff and one of the things that I look forward to in the future form of government is not putting staff to sit in the back of the room for hours at a stretch with comp time in the future and them being away from their families and it turns out oh yeah you're not getting to your article tonight anyway like that uh, they, their, their immense patience mm -hmm. with that and their willingness to continue to show up because it's the form of government that we have had all this time I think really speaks to a lot and I sometimes think that people in the audience do not respect the amount of effort and time you do your job all day long and then you're still sitting there just in case your thing comes up tonight and just in case there are questions tonight and they can't always read everyone's mind as to what they might be asked um, another thing that made things particularly awkward that I don't think we can really say as a note to the future council, but just to remind ourselves why things felt perhaps more fraught than usual in many cases was because we'd had the awkward interaction where we believed that we were going to be acting on certain town meeting articles and then the moderator changed his mind as to what we were going to do with those articles. And so it just made that much more work because we were trying to figure out multiple plays on every single situation given the circumstances there. And so, yes, town meeting's always a lot of work. There's always a lot of prep. There's always people sitting in the back of the room. But when you layer on all these other difficulties, it did make it that much more challenging. And so I was personally more short-tempered with things because we had gone through so much associated with trying to figure that out and trying to give the right guidance, not because we necessarily were particularly beholden to a particular opinion, but when the playing field changed, it made it difficult for us. So I appreciated that. Um, I did write down early on, and then I kind of lost <clears throat> interest in doing so, but some questions to follow up on in terms of the kinds of questions people have that we do hear fairly regularly and we aren't always as prepared to to say in a concise way and that's partly because they're complex issues like OPEB where how at least half the room is like I know it's a big thing I know we have to do it let's do it we're done and it could just be a consent calendar item because they've heard enough about it over time that they know it's just an obligation but there are always some people who do want to hear more about well what for example do, happens if the region isn't putting enough money in and then you know as things play out into the future how does that work and so being better prepared I think to think about those things and to be able to remind people as we eventually do during every session about how the enterprise funds work oh but except that enterprise fund that doesn't actually have enough money to do that etc it, it's just a lot for people to absorb for that small segment of people who actually want to try and understand that better and I'm just not sure how much more we can put in writing I'm not saying there's a perfect solution to that because it is just a very complex topic but it um, it sometimes throws people for a loop um, in terms of our EMS I think that we we have not always done a great job of explaining where our calls are coming from and I think we could do a little bit better with that instead of making more broad estimates associated with UMass use and with downtown use and with senior citizens use etc I think there should be more of a cheat sheet available when those kinds of questions come up around the budget because I know people talk about it in great detail while the budgets are being developed and the Finance Committee puts a lot in the book but being able to just go ahead and spout off a couple of those statistics I think would be really helpful to people because people do make a lot of assumptions about how those things work. More fine-grained. Yeah. And, um, and, and so it doesn't seem like we're just kind of you know, going with it on the spot, even though everybody does implicitly trust, I think largely, the public safety chiefs. And finally, associated with, because again, I'm 
I mean, how many nights did I actually do this for before I stopped? But associated with our sidewalk planning and figuring out, because more and more people have become interested in our sidewalks, and rather than saying, well, you can find this much information in the JCPC, et cetera, it's probably another project page. We need some place to be able to point people toward so that during the run-up to budget discussions in future council meetings, people can go and refresh themselves on what all the planning is associated with that, just putting out more and more information. Because again, you know, a lot of that was discussed in great detail at JCPC meetings, but it doesn't all make it into the report. And just having a place to be able to go and say, this is where the big thinking is around sidewalks, I think would help people to show that, yeah, we do have plans, actually. We're not just doing this on a, you know, a very casual basis. There is a, a well thought out process behind this and maybe there are gaps in the way we've been explaining that to people. Well, I think the TAC is still getting to that place. Yes, but they could be I, very I think, helpful I think they're in that. that. In that process of articulating that plan of prioritized work, I guess is the best way to describe it, as well as, you know, how does, the complete streets piece fit in with sidewalk because that's part of the complete streets vision. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, we have that to sign tonight before we leave. <laughs> um, but I think that, that that's will hopefully become a more prominent part of the, mm -hmm. the TAC's work and their page is to have that both from a street standpoint but also inclusive of sidewalk, bike lanes, all of those conversations so that when you know capital planning is going on, you have a sense of where the where the work will happen. Just if, if I could interject something I, uh, about the sidewalk and street planning, but particularly sidewalks. It happened at town meeting. It happened at Joint Capital Planning Committee. It will probably happen at council meetings. When you start talking about sidewalk needs, people immediately think about their street or their sidewalk, even at JCPC. But, oh, well, I live on, and that intersection is really bad because it's what they know. And, I, you know, but they immediately, and it was happening in town, many people immediately started talking about the one they knew about. And when there is more information, when TAC has that list, people want to go look and see where their street or their intersection or their sidewalk is on the list. And it goes a long way towards answering their questions if they, oh, it's in the third year because that's when there's this other, you know, whatever it is, but people immediately relate the conversation to their own kind of piece of neighborhood. So that's just, it seems to be human nature because it was happening. Well, the thing I think about is that with the streets, because we've gone through with, I think it's Scan Street's the name of the company, uh -huh. it goes through and does a grade on each of the streets on the roadway portion of it. If we have some similar type of metric for our sidewalks, I mean, there's more to it than just the condition of it. But you know, if 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 that's a place that TAC gets to, as far as They're either trying. a rubric for organizing mm -hmm. or and and so then people have that as a touchstone to then go and look at maybe some other section of town when they say, "Wow, that's way ahead of mine. Why so much?" And they go oh, to that street and they realize, "Oh, that sidewalks, you know, crumbling or whatever." Uh, so Scan Street can do sidewalks too. Mm -hmm. They have a, a similar machine. It's a mm -hmm. you know, segue that goes on alongside and does the same kind of analysis. I felt like the twenty thousand dollars was going to be. Just, I'd rather spend it on sidewalks than a machine right. looking at sidewalks because we have so so many needs. Right. Um, so I mean, the, there are some debates as to whether um, the priority where, where the priority is on some sidewalks. Uh, clearly, sidewalks when roads are being rebuilt go. You know that that that's part of the project. Um, you know whether you're trying to connect centers or if you're trying to do loops that people walk in loops sometimes that and. And so one of the things that we looked at actually is um, Strava, which is the, um, the, uh, the fitness app. You can mm -hmm. get the data from anybody who wears it, where they, where they travel, because it collects the data. And you can sort of superimpose where the heavy use things instead of just sort of eyeballing things and like that. That's at least one source of data that's already mm -hmm. existing in the world. Um, so Amy Rusecki had suggested we look at something like that. Um, so there's different ways of looking at the whole sidewalk thing. We don't have a lot of money to do sidewalks. I mean, we have a little bit, but not as much as we obviously need. Mr. Steinberg? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add to some of the comments that have been made is that um, it's important to distinguish between items that will come up in the future from the council and um, to remember that we now are getting into a legislative body that is going to be meeting on a regular basis throughout the year, 
possible soon biweekly until we know otherwise because they haven't figured out their own schedule yet obviously because they haven't been elected <laughs> but um, once they do you know they will be in a pattern where they can request information and then the proper staff person be, can be scheduled to come in and doesn't have to wait and um, information can just be provided to them in the ongoing course of doing business and I think that that's one of the advantages of having something that meets year-round as opposed to having a body that meets for a short period of time twice a year um, and uh, that is distinguishable from what we were just talking about which is an item that um, we would urge recognition and I think the manager is aware of this that there's a large body of public that would like that information and how not to make it accessible just to the council as the legislative body but how we make something available to the public and information where the public has a great interest and so those are two distinguishable things and my last comment is as we're extending thank yous I would also like to extend a thank you to um, Superintendent Morris and Mr. Mangano um, in particular because there were a number of questions that came up regarding school issues and um, they were extremely responsive in getting um, information back to town meeting quickly and um, I think they deserve our thanks for that. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate the thanks but uh, provide to the school's employees, but also to, you know, trying to sort of segment which kinds of things are the things that are like websites where you can find your street and you mm -hmm. can find your sidewalk versus the actual uh, council needing to look at it and then looking at it throughout the year at a scheduled time. So that will be really handy for everyone, including the people who are watching at home who've already looked up their sidewalk and now know they're going to talk about it on a particular night as opposed to some randomly scheduled night. Um, this is the part where you may wish to dissociate yourselves with me, but uh, this is the part that's going to get a little bit tricky in terms of how to say this that's not going to offend people, and I don't think it's going to work, that I'm still going to end up offending people. TMCC and eventually TMAC, since TMAC has been elected, um, has worked really hard to get a lot of information out to people. They've been excellent at providing handouts in our packets, and I think that that sort of thing will you know, be an important thing for the council's whatever employees to work with the town manager to figure out ways to do that sort of thing to help you know, make processes clearer. I think that's really helpful to people. Um, I do have substantial concerns about the style of what we used to call precinct meetings and became warrant review meetings because we used to distinguish because we said there was one thing that was a warrant review meeting that was sponsored by the League of Women Voters and TMCC and then there were precinct meetings and those became more broad because people realized that people in a neighborhood couldn't necessarily all show up at a certain time on a certain day and so they said anybody could come to them. My problem with those and I understand that we are going to have a we have some structure in the new charter associated with this but in terms of the um, suggestions to future people on the council to really think hard not only about what those specific outreach meetings are that they're required to have in the in the charter that no one's been required to have up until this point so that'll be a new thing they'll already be figuring out but also to consider other topic specific meetings that are staffed so to speak by people who know the answers to the questions people are going to ask. I remain incredibly frustrated that we would go to town meeting having everyone worked on everything and people would talk about things they learned at review meetings that were not based on facts. They were based on opinions and there had not been adequate factual information provided at those in those settings. And so I just would caution our future counselors as they come up with those meetings within their districts to work very carefully with staff to find out okay is there a thing that I really need expertise on here to answer questions associated with or that I say I'll go find that out from those people and come back rather than expecting staff again to go to 80 bazillion things but at the same time 
having just experienced it with unfortunately being at the time period when we thought we were not going to be acting on certain articles and then finding out two days later that we were, um, which obviously didn't make for that pleasant of a conversation at the particular warrant review I was at then, but it was no different than any other warrant review I've ever been to, which has been many over the years. And there was this feeling that it was for the people who'd shown up to talk about what they were concerned about, and that's very valuable. But at the same time, there were people there who were there to learn about the articles, and they were not hearing even two sides of the issue, much less the three or five sides of the issue that may have come out. And so I found them in some ways to be l negatively rather than beneficial toward the legislative process. And that's one of the reasons I was hesitant to deal with TMAC as well. And obviously, TMAC doesn't have anything to do if there aren't any town meetings. But I hope that people will think hard about what they're trying to accomplish in those things and balance that with working carefully with through the town manager as to what expectations are of staff. Because I know that over the years, it also became clear that there were some people who believed they should just go directly to staff and expect staff to show up for certain things. And you know, that all those kinds of standards, I think, are really important things for the future council to look at and for the town manager to be really clear about um, that things need to go through the town manager and that things, when there are public meetings, that we need to understand how we're educating people because we need to be making, it doesn't, I don't even think the word balanced is exactly the right word. It's that. There has to be someone there can, who can explain the actual situation that's on the table, and then people can disagree with facets of it, but to not even be able to explain what the basic issue is, I think is very unfortunate and does a disservice to our community. The terms I'm thinking of are information versus advocacy. Yes. And sort of keeping those distinctions clear. Um, and there's a place for both. Right. Um, like, for example, tonight when Mr. Steinberg asked Mr. Mooring about the one-way decision that was we got a factual answer from somebody who knew rather than Mr. Peoples. Well, you know, I saw it this way or there. But what I wanted to say is, I know we have the um, guidance document from KP Law clarifying special town meeting requirements. And I wonder, because I did wonder when we elected the TMAC and um, voted for TMCC again, thinking if there aren't going to be any more town meetings, um, what will these people do? And maybe being clear about expectations. So if we're thinking it's our direction that we're not going to have special town meetings, except in the narrow band given in that, to maybe write to that group. If they have meetings planned over the summer with a thought or an expectation that there might be a fall special town meeting, because I think I've heard from people that expectation, maybe we, we kind of owe it to um, TMAC and DMCC to clarify where our board is at about special town meetings so they're not going on one set of ex assumptions and we're going on another set of assumptions, but also maybe be an opportunity to thank TMCC for all the service they have provided to town meeting. But I, I think we're making an assumption or have an expectation based on KP law, whether they even read it or not, and their expectations may be really different. So I would say if, if, the, if the board thinks that that's a worthwhile thing to do, that I might compose a letter of that sort, not terribly lengthy, but just right. to sort of articulate, you know, yeah. from, from that. It's directly to them. So as opposed to them, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, again, talking about sort of meetings yeah. in public Going and trying to. Going to a website and reading a memo. Right. It's, right. it's a bit more proactive to reach out to them and, and have that conversation. So I would I'd be willing to write that, that uh, and then probably circulate it amongst you for feedback and go from there but right because yes. it, it's basically a cover it can be a cover memo to that exact document right. that right. we have the URL but right. our interpretation yeah. of that I think would be really valuable for people Seems everybody knows we're writing. on the same so page I think it makes sense that's a really good idea yeah thank you for that suggestion and I will compose that anyway. I have a light meeting, meeting schedule this week so I'm offering myself to do that <laughs> I'll remind you at the end of the week. <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah, I remember. If you, yeah, if you don't see something by Sounds Thursday or like Friday. Sounds like a good idea. Later. Right. So are there other comments or topics we want to bring up relative to, to town meeting and, and sort of wrapping that up? 
want to make sure we have an opportunity to sort of clear that out. And hopefully Mr. Wald will share any thoughts he might have via email in the short term. But um, Thank you for giving us the opportunity. No, it's absolutely. I'm, I'm glad that we, I fully remember, had forgotten that when I was moving us along in the agenda. And so I'm glad you reminded me because it is a valuable process that we go through in, in having that conversation. Um, so I think next on our agenda is, is uh, we'll go to the town manager's report. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I, uh, as everybody I hope knows, uh, Ms. Deborah Puppel is retiring. Um, her last day of work will be Thursday of this week. We had a really nice gathering in, on Friday afternoon, and uh, the chair spoke, and uh, people, several people complimented me on your speech because <laughs> they, they really felt it was moving. And I think she, uh, Ms. Puppel, was really pleased, I think, and has expressed that to people about the number of people who showed up, uh, the, the select board members who, who were in town who showed up, and the former select board members and representatives from the University of Massachusetts and um, you know, department heads and colleagues. And she was, and I thought it was real, I was really happy that her husband and her mother and her sister were there because uh, sometimes they don't really appreciate, they don't understand how much people appreciate uh, their daughter or sister or wife. And this is, it was really a great venue for people to articulate how much um, Ms. Puppel meant to the community and the work and that she um, did over the course of the years, especially during the, those really traumatic times when she she didn't want to keep it together, but had to keep it together while everybody else was not keeping it together. So, and um, a lot of people, have, you know, uh, others have said a lot of people have received credit for that, but she was really a, a pivotal person in that whole scenario as well. So, um, and then we also know that, and we'll talk more about this later, Ms. Burgess will be retiring at the end of June, but I'm pleased to announce that we have two very excellent candidates who uh, I've appointed in their, um, to, um, fill their roles. Uh, first, Margaret Nardowitz will be returning as to the town as town clerk. Uh, she's a town government veteran um, who was hired by Stan Zomack in 1988 as a clerical assistant in the DPW and then was transferred to the town, got transferred to the town clerk's office and she eventually served as assistant town clerk, acting town clerk and town clerk until 2003. And then she um, with her children at a certain age, decided she went to work part-time and became the town administrator in Sunderland and then currently is serving as a town administrator in Rutland. Uh, this was an opportunity she was eager to embrace. It's a, and so she's very excited to return to the town of Amherst. So we have someone who's experienced both as a town clerk and as a town administrator, which I'm really pleased about because of the role that this town clerk, will, I anticipate, will play in terms of both being the town clerk, but also helping to serve the new council, much as the town clerk serves the town meeting now. I'm hoping that the council will see that uh, Ms. Nardowitz will be that person to do that. Um, really happy about that. Uh, very strong uh, applicant pool, um, and uh, it's a tough decision, but she was uh, certainly with that, that combination of qualifications uh, rose to the top. Um, as terms of the executive system to the town manager, um, I've hired Angela Mills, who is uh, currently administrative assistant at Crocker Farm Elementary School. And she, uh, she is an Amherst resident, graduate of Amherst College, parent and sports coach who's worked at Crocker Farm for eight years while her children were young. Now they're a little bit older and she's eager to take on a new challenge and work uh, year round. Um, she's also worked at Smith College, Trinity College, and Northfield Mount Hermon School. Um, she, she did a tremendous uh, job through the interview process and, and is a, a real um, person who gets things done, which is really something that we all know with Ms. Puppel's experience, we need someone who's able to take on tasks and, and make decisions and, and get, things get things done. Um, so uh, Ms. Nardowitz has to give 60 days notice under her contract with Rutland, so she won't start until August 1. She was in last Friday, and she's going to be coming in on Fridays to work with Ms. Burgess 
uh, over the course of the summer so she can start to get up to speed on some of the election stuff that she's out of date on. Uh, she'll be obviously going to school for, for additional, to get the updates on town clerk things. There'll be one month in between where Ms. Odette, the assistant town clerk, has agreed to serve as the acting town clerk um, for the month of July because these are all going to be critical times with the election dates and things like that. So it's really uh, fortunate that we have Ms. Odette, who's totally experienced in, in this work as well, uh, ready to step in and will you know, handle the work without, without missing a beat. Uh, Ms. Mills, um, we've agreed that uh, she will finish out the school year at Crocker Farm and then we'll move over to us uh, probably around July 1st, uh, depending on her schedule and her kids' schedules, basically. Um, and so there, um, we will have a few weeks without, um, without anybody in that position, but Ms. Puppel has agreed to come back uh, when uh, Ms. Mills is available full-time to help guide her through the, the job. Um, we had a really strong interview committees uh, who helped um, review the candidates and put them through their paces. Um, the town clerk screen, screening com committee included Robert Pam, Joan Rabin, Jeff Kravitz, Kay Moran, and Joanne Mizziazic uh, from, from the HR office. Um, and for the executive assistant, we had um, Stephanie O'Keefe, Deb Radway, Dave Zomack, and Brianna Sunrid um, all put in a lot of time, reviewed. There were a lot of candidates for both positions, very uh, competitive uh, positions, but really felt like we um, uh, hit home runs with both positions and felt we had a pretty deep talent pool of people who had applied. So that was, it was really gratifying to see the number of people who are eager to work for the town of very high quality. And typically, I think Ms. Puppel said this, the reason she came to, to Amherst, because she was, came from as a small town administrator, was that she wanted to work with a group of talented colleagues, and that's what she found. And um, that's what several of these people said, well, I want to work with a team of people who are really good at their jobs, and that's what was inspiring me. So very happy with those. Those are the big news for us, and it was a, a big relief for us, a big effort by the um, Deb Bradway and Joanne to make all this come together. That's a lot of logistics and confidentiality that has to be played, and um, they did a great job. A few other things I want to mention is you've got the written report, and I'm just going to highlight a few things. Um, the next Cup of Joe is Friday. It's going to be at Amherst Coffee with Economic Development Director Jeff Kravitz. We're talking about economic development a lot this summer. I thought he would be a good person to be there to um, help answer questions, but anybody can come back, come around and talk to anything, about anything there. Um, there will be some, um, uh, the uh, sculptures that were, were discussed with the board before, they've relocated all of the sculptures to Kendrick Park, so we will have four temporary sculptures placed in Kendrick Park. Uh, one thing that um, I wanna make a point of is that, um, they are, there are going to be some trees taken down, but it's not related to this. Uh, the tree warden said over the past six years, we've been removing remnants of an old hemlock hedge on Kendrick Park as they have declined or died from hem hemlock woolly uh, delegid. Today I made the call to remove the remaining trees since they were either dead or would be in a couple years. Um, and he, just, he was saying that the, the Crosstown art installations don't have anything to do with it, but it will seem like it to people, but mm -hmm. they're two separate events, and he's been meaning to do this. Um, we talked about the social services funding. Um, we talked about the Factory Hollow Dyke. Um, so, um, we talked about the charter change. Oh, uh, so and, and I was really pleased that uh, the LSSC staff were at South Point to gather information from people. And um, I went, uh, Dave and I went down there, and it was sort of a, not a great day, but they set up at a great place because they were in between the residences and where the mailboxes are. So everybody had to walk by them if they were going to go to their mailbox. Um, I've uh, invited a consultant in to do a review of operations on the first floor of our offices. And I think I've mentioned this to you before that. Um, you know, we have a, a, you know, a soon-to-be-vacant town clerk position. We have a, um, the treasure collector position vacant. 
we have a number of people who are anticipating retiring or know their date already or are thinking about things. And um, I, what I was really felt the need for is someone who would look at this objectively in terms of creating a three, five, seven year plan for how we were gonna be staffing that entire first floor. Um, so for relatively short money, we've hired a person who has been a treasure collector. Her name is Maureen Valente. Um, has also been town administrator, town manager in the town of Sudbury, and also by happenstance the executive director of the Mass School Building Authority. Very and worked at the International City Management Association. Uh, very experienced person. She's been here. She's interviewed a number of people. She's going to talk to everyone on the first floor, understand what their jobs are, what their concerns are, and try to help think through some of the things that um, staffing uh, decisions help me think through the staffing decisions as we move forward over the next few years. So we have a game plan on where we're going. Um, this is typically something that I think the finance director would um, would do, but we don't have someone in that, that uh, in that position at this moment in time. And But I still need that high level of thinking and, um, and the, I think she will provide that. And so that's where the funds will be coming from, from the finance director's um, salary, basically. Um, Beacon Communities want to highlight that the official groundbreaking is June 14th, um, and the chair will be speaking at that, along with and there's some hope that the governor will show up, and that's that'd be really exciting if he did. It's a big project. Um, many of you were at the uh, Bang Center um, for the Busani Center opening. They received their final permits on June 1st, and um, again, the chair spoke at, at that, and um, the official opening date for the um, Musani Center is now set for June 11th. Um, we talked about the North Common. Health insurance, the uh, change to a new health insurance um, uh, fully insured pro product is going around, around really well along, again, HR has been handling most of this along with Kay Zolgar and um, school staff. We've had 22 um, information meetings um, typically, I do a little present, you know, two or three, two to five minute presentation about why we're doing things, and then the uh, Blue Cross and Maya, Maya people explain what we're doing. And that's been, um, those have been really good. People have been pretty receptive. Some people are upset about the change and they express that, but, you know, that's to be under, to be expected. Um, uh, we have two people, uh, Amy Rizeki and Holly Bowser, who've been accepted into the uh, Suffolk University MMA Certificate in Local Government Leadership and Management Program. That will, will begin in September. It's really good. It's a, it's a very competitive academic program. Uh, it'll be held in Northampton, so it's convenient to everybody. It's 25 days of class, five graduate level courses, and there's two people who um, aspire to be leaders in the, in the community, uh, in the town, and we're really eager to cultivate their interest in being being leaders and developing a broader range of uh, expertise in HR and finance in uh, strategic planning and all the different uh, um, community involvement things that, that you need to be a, a, a good community leader. And um, I think that's, that's enough for you have questions. So I'm open to, happy to answer them. Questions for the manager relative to his report or? not then um well thank you for that mm -hmm. um informative what's that i'm sorry oh, just very informative thank you yes it was absolutely so i would say we could yes go ahead actually this is something i'd like to have find some way to discuss appropriately at a future meeting which is um, as a follow-up on the public comment we received earlier associated with the bid I am not asking for the same things the public comment person asked for however what I'm asking about is for the town manager to remind us about the fact that the town is part of the bid and so I remain somewhat concerned about the fact that the bid wrote a letter that said something that the town is therefore party to if the town is part of the bid and the same in, in a similar vein 
there was uh, information associated with Tommy Nagarigal on inclusionary zoning where the bid had hired an attorney to refute what the town was trying to do. And I just am trying to understand and, and hope that we could have a brief discussion about that at some point in the future, how the town hires an attorney to sue itself over um, a zoning article. So that, that it, which is not, I'm sure, the way the bid would describe it, but that is kind of how it turns out when you're a member of the bid and the bid goes and does something like that. So um, I, I would like a better understanding of how that works moving forward, and that applies to the council as well in terms of understanding how that role of um, the town fits in as a bid member as opposed to just a partner, so to speak. And there are points of conflict between what the bid membership may want to do versus the town's goals. Yeah. I don't think there's a lawsuit against the town by the bid. No, but I when... I think you said there was a lawsuit. There is not. I though. should not have threat said that. Of, the, I said threatened okay. suit against... The town threatened suit against itself, basically through its membership in the bid. And it doesn't make sense to me that... And that's the conversation I would like mm -hmm. you to have with whoever you need to have it before you describe it to us again, because if the town is a paying member of the bid and provides certain services in lieu of money, et cetera, and then the bid says, here's what the bid thinks about this, that get, starts getting a little bit muddy. And they thought they should talk about a potential litigation, though not an actual lawsuit. Right. Are there other That'll comments? That'll be an or? interesting topic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I'll be here for that one. So if there's not other questions for the manager, I'd, I'd uh, ask the members for their reports. So select board member reports if anyone has any meetings or otherwise that they've gone to. I will can go I quick and, ask a question of the town manager? I even pulled this out of my old stack of papers for you. I thought that you wanted to talk about the sustainability committee charge again at some point. At some point I do. Okay. B par pardon me? At some, at some point I do. But right. It, it Somehow I was under agenda. the impression yeah. it was now. And so, okay, great. We're not ready for that. Excellent. So I will mention one quick thing. I did go to the, uh, the AGCOM meeting. Um, this past week and, and so they're heading into their dormant period when the farmers themselves are not dormant but they are as a committee because they're just the farmers are busy you know when you get to this time of year and so they they typically take the summer off and come back in September but the topic that was on their agenda was um, marijuana cultivation and so I my suggestion to them was to reach out to Mr. Kravitz and and have him perhaps kind of bring together some of the information specifically about that that's evolving out of the the um, Cannabis Control Commission and you know our own regulation that sort of thing just to give them and he's got time because they aren't going to be until September but to kind of bring it together because I think uh, it's potentially that that some folks um, either farmers themselves or other businesses may reach out to farmers to to you know, sort of activate cultivation in our community because we are a farming community and, and there may be um, some interest in that. And, and given the, that adult use uh, marijuana doesn't require the vertical integration that medical marijuana de, did, I guess, is the current circumstance. So it changes the dynamics of a lot of that. So I think that's a topic that they will take up in, in earnest in the, in the fall um, because I think they as membership and also farmers in town will also be interested in, in in that topic and sort of what what the rules are what the mm -hmm. constraints you know all those kinds of things are so that was really the primary piece of it we didn't get into any real detail at this point but but uh that was what was uh, on the agenda for the uh, for the agcom so who would like to go next it's Kruger. and because it's also only two things and one is about marijuana so uh, maybe I'll do that one first since you're just talking about it. So um, the zoning articles around mar uh, marijuana establishments passed at town meeting. It's the third time we've gone to town meeting <coughs> to try to keep up with the regulatory um, uh, changes, and I think we're doing a good job. Um, but today uh, the internal working group 
on marijuana, all things marijuana met, and we hadn't met for a while because first we were working on stuff for town meeting and then the town meeting period. And we spent most of the meeting, and uh, Ms. Brew was there as well, so she may want to chime in, um, looking at a memo that um, Mr. Kravitz wrote to Mr. Bockelman um, in May, in mid-May, May 14th, um, <coughs> which was talking about the issue of licensing. We've talked about um, another layer of regulatory control with lo local licensing. And in this memo, just to the snippet that I thought, uh, I think we spent most of our time with, it's just delaying additional retail marijuana establishments until such a time as the town develops and implements a local licensing process as a prudent course of action because of the significant interest Amherst has received by potential recreational marijuana retail operators. Amherst does not currently have a policy in place to evaluate and consider the benefits of a particular establishment vis-a-vis -vis another potential establishment. Um, and it talks about delaying um, any more decisions on for, for recreational use, um, not the ones that are medical now and, and can co-locate, but um, this should be a date certain July 1st, 2019, in which additional recreational retail establishments will be considered even if local licensing has not been set up. Third, the manager may choose to end this policy at any time prior to July 1, 2019. So we spent a, a lot of time, in my mind, the local licensing process comes at the end of a number of permits and reviews and gives the town one more tool to kind of take back a license in the way we do sort of like rental registration. But, um, and other people felt like it was an evaluation criteria that if we didn't like one establishment because it wasn't offering things more aligned with our goals or values, we could use the licensing to reject that applicant, maybe holding out for an applicant that was offering um, more of what we wanted. And so we spent a lot of time talking about that and it made me think that it would be worthwhile having that conversation, conversation on a future select board agenda, that it's more of a community conversation. I mean, again, we're in uncharted waters. What is the role of the license? Um, Ms. Brewer had said, well, some communities, the CCC says you don't have to just accept any old, um, you know, Tom, Dick, or Harry who walks through the door. You can set out what your per preferred criteria is in a, in a request for proposal kind of process. We hadn't really explored that. so. Um, because the downtown sites that are eligible now with the buffer zone are quite limited, there's sort of some competition for those. And is it like first one through the door or is it the one who um, you know, offers the best package, whatever those elements are? I'm not sure we, we even know what it is that we prefer over something else. But um, now that we're kind of back to thinking about the next stage of this, um, what would this board like to do? So I was suggesting it as a, as a future agenda item, but um, it's kind of a fresh conversation. And let me just add the only other report. Downtown Parking Working Group has met last, last week and the week prior. We're working on finalizing a memo to the town manager on a number of points that he had come and discussed with that group. And um, I'm hoping we, we put it to rest. <coughs> Wednesday we meet. Um, the select board has a hearing date for the changes we talked about it a couple weeks ago, another memo with some um, immediate recommendations that are forming that. So uh, there's a memo to the manager almost done, and then there's a couple more meetings this summer. We hope to be helping uh, flesh out a, a scope and an RFP or RFQ for a parking consultant to work with the committee now that the budget's approved, but won't be in fact till July 1. So it's my parking update. You can tell from earlier conversations tonight, it's for me, it's all about park and pay. <laughs> you park, you pay. Um, anyway, um, I don't know if there was anything else on the marijuana conversation. So if I could first start with the second part of her Parking report, pay. which is when is the hearing? I know we talked about oh. when we thought we might be able to schedule it, but were we able to yet? I think it's. Mm -hmm. 25th, yeah. I think. Yeah. It's the 25th because the notice timeline so was such that we needed. So it's our last June meeting. 
think so. Because we yes. didn't think we'd yeah. have enough yes. time to Perking do it before here. that. Yeah. Public hearing, because we're going to do Fisher Street, um, impact on Harris Street, Olympia Drive. All park. Could we please park put group. that in next week's packet, The a copy of that notice? We haven't written yet, but sure. Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> we I mean, I know you agenda. have to get it sent into right. the Gazette. 14 days prior right. to the 14th, so we have right. to have it by the 11th. But at least you have okay. that date in your mind. Right. right, so that's helpful. But yeah, and then just once it's written, I don't mean like a separate thing, just once it's written to put that in our packet, but it, we should just make that, um, depending on the timing. So in regards to the, to the marijuana issue, to be to be really clear on the fact that Mr. Kravitz is put in this incredibly awkward position on a regular basis, that's apparently what one of the things we pay him for, is to interact with people who are coming up with ideas for different kinds of businesses. And it's really difficult for him to give guidance that reflects what the community thinks with marijuana because it's still such a new topic. And so we can obviously talk about the planning, we can talk about the different conversations we've had, but he's he's in an interesting position that that's um, all too easy for anyone from anywhere to criticize whether within or without a town hall so i appreciate that he it would be really helpful to him to have some written guidance and so i appreciate that and again he doesn't work for us only the town manager works for the select board and so i i really appreciate that he put something together because we've been you know working around this issue what would lo we kept saying we wanted the ability to do local licensing even though we didn't know what it was we just wanted to be able to have that option and um, he has put in a ton of work you know working with other groups and the ccc has also gotten additional information associated with the other ccc you know uh associated with what local regulations look like elsewhere and since every state is different and there are county level things and yada 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 um nothing's ever simple and nothing's easily just like oh boom we'll just take theirs theirs is good um so he's done a ton of research but is also trying to figure out how to answer questions for people associated with things and so i appreciated that he put this policy together he even let the internal working group look at it and um tech, you know so, and, and provide feedback associated with it and then he gave it to his employer the town manager and i do think it is even though the town manager has all the authority to actually sign host community agreements which is why we have never discussed the components of community host community agreements and until they were after they were signed, um, except in a very broad sense many years ago. Um, I think it's probably is time for us to try and, despite our summer schedule, find a way to have this conversation because applications are going to start coming in for purely recreational. We also need to have, I think, the actual conversation that we've been kind of dancing around for a while as to whether or not we are willing to entertain any additional letters of op support or non-opposition for medical because he needs to be able to answer those questions effectively to people when they call him up. You know, they're not coming and waiting for the select board to have a conversation three weeks from now. They're asking him what's gonna happen next week. <laughs> so it's, um, it puts him in a really difficult position. And so as we dug into this further, we realized that that concept about the values and the benefits is really tricky, right? Because you know, one person can interpret it one way based on what they believe they've been hired to do, but then if they're gonna get second guessed, that's really not to their advantage. So we don't have a great way right now of capturing a values discussion in a host community agreement. And we have, in fact, asked many weeks ago for a model host community agreement for recreational from KP Law that we don't have yet. We've had a number of opinions from them, but we don't have that yet. Um, and we don't have a, a perfectly obvious way of addressing the values question at the Zoning Board of Appeals either because it's either you know, it fits or it doesn't fit. It meets these conditions or it doesn't meet these conditions. That's not that bigger values question. Then there's the question as to whether or not we should even have a values question because we don't have values questions around whether or not a restaurant opens. And we think, wow, it's a crazy idea to open that kind of restaurant. But <coughs> good luck to you because you're paying the money, you're meeting the rules, go for it. Some people feel that marijuana is a little different because it's a new market and we do want to think about things. And as Ms. Kruger pointed out, the CCC has said to us, well, you could do some sort of RFP process. We didn't do that for medical. And so we don't have the history of trying to do that. And it's also really weird because it's not like a situation where we can say, here's this empty mill building. 
people tell tell us what you want to do with that empty mill building. Like, we don't own these properties. We're we're not so. I don't even really understand how we would do an RFP in a situation like that beyond learning from other people that have something other than mill buildings um, to do that. And so none of this is completely obvious as to how to fix the conversation, but it seems like it's probably time for us as a group here, since we hear from the larger community, so that we can feed to the town manager and he can talk to Mr. Kravitz to um, figure out what aspects of this we want to try and tease out further. Because again, under the town government act, under the charter, he can make tons of decisions as the town manager. But if we want him to incorporate any of our ideas and our thinking about this and ways of approaching some of these things, we're gonna need to have a conversation at some point. Right. And I think that in, in some ways, this certainly is a topic that's you know not admitting of delay, as they say. Yes, um, it's, it's really not because it's you know it's it's and and you know it's it's kind of like the arguments we made at town meeting relative to the zoning, in that if you don't have it in place, it's left to the building commissioner to make a certain determination, and then you've essentially grandfathered in certain rules, even if you change them later, and so you don't. It, it's hard to retroactively sort of apply the rules, and so I think we. Mm -hmm will need to sort of take this up in some fashion. Yes. So yeah, I think that's it's really important for that conversation because I think that memo that I think Mr. Kraus shared with you a couple of weeks ago that you had a chance to talk about this today was um, a way to start for us to frame what are the issues, um, the town meeting action <laughs> to create zoning. Uh, a, there, there's, a, there's a, a tense pressure to be first to market. And so there's a lot of economic anxiety among developers or people who want to take, get the license and be the first one out there because that's really important in this, in this industry. Um, the um, KP Law has recognized this. They've been working on a generic host community agreement for all their communities. They've put a ton of time into it. It's taken a lot more time than we had anticipated, but this is going to be something that's going to go out to all of their member communities, but it's going to be significantly different than are the typical host community agreement that you, that we see, um, and you know there are real consequences to decisions that are going to be made. So if the way that zoning passed by town meeting means that you get one license and say the center of town, and then you're exiting out everybody else, and how do you allocate that license? And barring any other discussion, the building commissioner in essence could could issue a permit. And that would be without any, we need to have the, they also need some things, host community agreement and all these other things, but we need to have an informed discussion about what are the values. If we have one thing, you know, do we auction it? Do we RFP it? Do we just say, this is gonna generate the most economic activity for us? Um, you know, if you said you could have one restaurant, do you want Shea Albert or do you want McDonald's? And you get to choose, right. and what are the values? One one could be better than the other, who knows? So. And I think it is, it's a complicated topic, which you, because you've spent an enormous amount of time talking about it, you know it better than most 99.9% .9 of people in the state. Um, but it, we do need support in thinking about through these, what these things are and what the values are of the community. Because there are, uh, there is, we get, I mean, I'm sure he told you, but we get uh, inquiries all the time for people who want to cultivate or to um, to open shops, mm -hmm. and some people don't know what they're doing. Some people are very sophisticated, and he's he's what do we, do we? And my question is, do we want to embrace it? You know, we, we sort of said we know where we want to be with medical. We said we want four. That was great guidance, but do we want to embrace it or do we want to say, you know, we have represented from other boards who are saying, don't say yes to these too many of them. We don't want to bring this into the town. It's hard. That was kind of what was happening in our meeting because sure. we were not, they weren't wrong positions. We were staking out different positions, you know, on a spectrum of, of places. And it's like, we're just an internal working group. Right. We, we don't get to decide this. And even just the present, I mean, these are real, these have real time consequences. Yes. Just the existence of this memo had a chilling effect on somebody, rightly or wrongly, had a chilling effect on someone who's interested in one of the downtown properties. Mm -hmm. I didn't real understand that was related to the cancellation of a of a community meeting. It was a you know downtown property owner who ran into one of us who's already you know upset. So 
it is timely. Some people in the working group conversation said, well, of course, this should all wait until the council is seated. You can't make any more decisions about it. I disagree, but until we have the conversation and are clear, we each bring our own perspectives or the boards that we represent perspectives, um, you know, why rush it now? Just slow it all down and go slow. This amount is enough or what, you know, we had a really inter interesting but somewhat, um, it wasn't contentious, but spirited discussion. Spirited, yeah, let's call it. And, um, you know, these discussions take a lot of energy. Like, no, I don't like this. <laughs> or, I like this. Or, I think we heard each other's point of views, but we were sort of starting to relitigate it, you know, by the last half an hour, we were saying the things we said at the beginning. And, and one of the things where it starts to get complicated, and, uh, well, it's already complicated, but in another area in which it starts to get, it continues to be complicated is associated with an additional letter of support or non-opposition for a particular property that's trying to make a transition at this point in time. Left them and, and then there is also the difficulty of the uh, my, which I then try and match up on the one hand, yes, we are trying to do this, we are out in front of it, we are making it happen, we are embracing it. And at the same time, I'm having some difficulty understanding how I translate the community's values associated with medical and recreational slash adult use. Because any place that advertise, that says they want medical right now doesn't. That's the reality. What they want is they want a leg up for adult use and recreational. Do we not have a problem with that? Well, okay, then we don't have a problem with that. But I, I feel like we need to have that conversation and we've we've put it off because we had everything going on with town meeting and the, vo the charter vote and everything else. It just was like impossible. But I don't think we can put it off until the council because applicants will start to come in and they will, they, they have to have a host community agreement before they can get very far with the state. They can like fill out some sections of the application. So when you read what the state's doing, they're like, so many people have filled out four sections of the application, but not five. And so they will be coming to us. They do have to have that community meeting. They do have to have the host community agreement. There's just so many layers now, and yet it's still early days that we're still kind of dealing with the old stuff as we're trying to deal with the new. So we're in the we're in an awkward place on a number of different fronts. And so we do need to be able to have staff be able to give accurate advice to people who aren't quite willing to go public yet, but are trying to do exploratory stuff so that we don't later say, ah shucks, we wish they hadn't done that. Because if we're not giving anybody anything to work with, they can't do it. Mr. Steinberg, do you have a report? Oh, okay. So I think that that's, you know, just to the marijuana question, it's, it's you know, valuable for me as far as agenda setting and thinking about when and how much of that conversation um, we'll need to put into our agenda setting and, and that sort of thing. But if there's not other select board member reports, I'm not sure there's anything else on our agenda. Yes. I wanted to ask that when we do have that, we already said today at internal working group that you wouldn't put it on the agenda for the 11th. <laughs> So don't. Because we want to let people know. <laughs> right. right. No, and we want, no because way. we want to be able to specifically invite people. We want to be able to invite people from the business community. We right. want to be able to invite the entire Board of Health, for example. So that even, you know, if we don't make any kind of decision, and what, of course, that means, though, is we need more time on the agenda. Because right. if we're going to well, hear from it, other it, people. It may also beg the question whether it should be a separate meeting for just that conversation and feedback that from people. So might be good so we'll that we don't, it doesn't, that. that time doesn't get eaten up by. Right. Um, Thank you for considering it, all those alternatives. I don't know if we would take up the other, the piece of that is, you know, the herbology request and the medical is part of that broader conversation or do we need to get back to that in this, as a, another action item? My suggestion would be that we try and have the conversation completely separate of that, even though we know that exists, just like we know there are people looking to develop downtown. So I think that rather than trying to say, we'll put herbology on the same agenda and see where we get <laughs> an hour into it, seems unfair to them as well. But, but knowing their time concerns, et cetera, that causes me to think sooner rather than August, you know. Could that have this conversation? Be as soon as June 11th? Could 
no way, I, I don't think I explained that right at all then. Mm-hmm. Herbology is not going to come, be, in my opinion, is not going to come before us until after we have this entire oh, discussion. Okay, after. Yeah. I, I thought you were saying that that was time sensitive. And we well, it, it is in terms of June and to them, <laughs> but versus September right, I misunderstood to us. what you were Yeah, asking. that's what I was trying to say, and I didn't want to try and put them on the same night. No, not the same, but I thought you were saying before. But Okay, good. I do have just one announcement. Please. Ray Samity Day, remember, town meeting, approved, uh, passed this resolution, I believe unanimously, in 2015, Mr. Slaughter, I believe, is going to present it at the event, which is on Sunday, June 10th. It's always the second Sunday, and as usual, it's from 2 to 4 p.m., but this year it's at the Unitarian Church Hall, so it is indoors. You do not need to RSVP. Please show up for stories, fellowship, fun, music, and dance, and the Ray Amity Day proclamation is available online because we did it way back in February. If there is not other things, which I think we're we've exhausted our agenda, <laughs> if and not ourselves, ourselves. <laughs> I would take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And we're adjourned at ten thirty-eight p.m.